Hi, my name is Lindsay Marr. I'm a professor of civil and environmental engineering at Virginia Tech, and I'm pleased to be co-chairing this workshop with John Samet, Dean of the Colorado School of Public Health. We welcome you to the third in a three-part series of workshops on indoor air management of airborne pathogens. While we are gathered virtually today, the National Academies is physically housed on the traditional lands of the Nakutchank and Piscataway peoples past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations. We honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these peoples and nations in this land. We thank them for their resilience in protecting this land and aspire to uphold our responsibilities to their example. I wanna thank the planning committee, the National Academy staff and today's moderators and participants, all of whom have worked hard to bring together this exciting event. This is the third workshop in a series of three. The first workshop highlighted the progress made in the management of airborne pathogens indoors since 2020. The second workshop focused on reducing airborne pathogen transmission in schools. This workshop series is part of the National Academy's Environmental Health Matters Initiative. The vision of EHMI is to improve the health of all people equitably by promoting evidence-based assessment, prevention, adaptation, and strategic mitigation of complex and interconnected environmental stressors that affect human health and disease. EHMI provides connection, credibility, stewardship, and neutrality. Our sponsors include the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, the Environmental Protection Agency, the National Institutes of Health, and ExxonMobil. In addition to their interest in environmental health issues, the sponsors also recognize the National Academy's core value of operating independently from any sponsorship. This workshop series grew out of a National Academy's virtual workshop in August 2020 on airborne transmission of SARS-CoV-2. In that workshop, we established the mechanisms of airborne transmission and evidence for it, from emissions of the virus and respiratory droplets and aerosols to exposure to infection. Now we are focusing on how human, human behavior and the built environment affect and can mitigate exposure to airborne pathogens. Now we'll talk about this present series of workshops on indoor air management of airborne pathogens. I'd like to thank the planning committee members who are shown here. I'm not gonna read all their names, but we aim to have a diverse group of multidisciplinary experts to help plan this series. The goals of the overall series um, are shown here. We have convened an interdisciplinary and multi-sectoral group of scientists together with facilities managers and engineers, workers, and representatives of those using the facilities. The overall goals are to review the state of knowledge concerning building management, ventilation, and air cleaning for airborne pathogens, um, to discuss experiences with management of enclosed spaces during the pandemic, and to identify promising practices that can be adopted to make these places safer. This slide shows the overall framework of our discussion. We're taking the items on the left, um, research, practice, and mechanistic understanding, and using them to figure out what works, how we can use what, work, what works, and then to verify that it actually does work. We are interested in moving from efficacy or what should work to effectiveness of what really works. I'm going to uh, spend a couple of minutes reviewing what happened in the first couple of workshops. Um, the first workshop covered lessons learned over the past two and a half years about management of airborne pathogens. We discussed scientific advances and innovations along with organizational management and response. Here are some of the main messages from that meeting. First, masking, ventilation, filtration, and UV reduce the amount of virus in the air, the infectious virus, and thus reduce the risk of transmission. These approaches are stronger together than alone. We must also consider energy efficiency in our optimization. 
Two, we need to start with the basics, ensuring that our existing engineering systems are appropriately designed, sized, and operating. Then we can think about further optimization using CO2 sensors, carbon dioxide sensors, and other innovations. Three, implementation requires attention to human factors. We need to increase people's confidence in the engineering and technological solutions while recognizing that different organizations have different missions and cultures. The second workshop focused on schools. We identified practices that can be adopted and implemented at different levels from an individual classroom all the way up to the federal government in order to reduce transmission of airborne pathogens and make education equitable and safe. Here are some of the main messages from that meeting. There are more than 100,000 schools nationwide, and there is tremendous variation in school buildings and engineering controls and components from school to school. And this variability poses a complex set of problems. Two, there are three main engineering controls in school buildings that have been shown to work, ventilation, filtration, and germicidal UV. While we know that these can be effective, it does not mean that they always are, mainly because the actual performance or effectiveness varies from school to school. And thus, we have to continually assess and verify the effectiveness. Three, greater efforts aimed at equitable distribution of resources are needed at the national scale, addressing barriers to improving ventilation and other engineering controls in schools and identifying facilitators to increase buy-in from school districts. And four, implementation remains a critical barrier for schools. In today's workshop, we are aiming to identify promising practices that can be adopted at different levels to make access to public transportation equitable and safe. In today's workshop, we have three sessions. In session one, we'll review the state of knowledge about research regarding public transportation safety and management to reduce transmission of airborne pathogens equitably. In session two, we'll hear case studies about on the ground experiences. These are meant to inspire and serve as a base for concrete implementation. In session three, we'll explore how to overcome barriers to implementation and identify roles for different stakeholders at the federal, state, and local levels in the non-government sector. And then finally, at the end of the workshop series, coming up soon, we will be producing a report of, in the format of a proceedings in brief. These workshops are designed to be highly interactive and to look at case studies that reflect people's lived experiences during the pandemic. We expect that these workshops will help pave the way for more effective management of indoor air when it comes to airborne pathogens. All right, let's get started. It is my pleasure to introduce the first session's moderator, Kath, Dr. Kath Noakes. She is a professor of environmental engineering for buildings in the School of Civil Engineering at the University of Leeds. Dr. Noakes, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Uh, thank you. And thank you to the panel uh, for inviting me to chair this session today. So the goals of this first session are to review the state of knowledge surrounding research around public transport safety and management and how we can use that to reduce transmission of airborne pathogens in an equitable way. Um, throughout this, we'll invite audience members to submit questions at any time using the Slido platform, which uh, the, the link will be put in the chat and people can vote on those questions. And we'll do as, as best we can to address as many of these as possible during the panel discussion after the talks today. Um, as you can see on this slide, we have a fantastic lineup this session with two speakers. We have Susan Grant Muller from the University of Leeds and Jody Holton from the Southeastern Pennsylvania uh, Transportation Authority. Um, and then we will be joined following these two talks by uh, two panelists, uh, Madeline Parker and Jason DeBrow. Um, so all of the speakers and panelist bios can be found on our website um, and the link of that will be in the chat. Okay, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, who is Dr. Susan Grant Muller. Susan is a, a chair in technologies and informatics for the Institute of Transport Studies at the University of Leeds. And she's going to be talking about factors that influence COVID-19 transmission on public transport. So Susan, if you could unmute and share your screen and a reminder, we've got 15 minutes for the presentation.
Thank you very much for that um, welcome. And it's great to be here today in this very interesting, very challenging topic. I'd like to speak today about some of the factors that influence COVID-19 transmission on ground public transport. Let's start with a key question of concern. Since the onset of the pandemic, um, virus transmission, uh, the actual amount of virus transmission that happens on public transport has been really difficult to detect. Um, this is, uh, it's difficult to directly attribute it to the public transport setting because of course transport sits within a wider, a, a wider lifestyle. The environment is highly transient, particularly for shorter journeys. There's a lot of variation between different modes and even variation within a single mode because of features like the carriage design, capacity, ventilation system. And of course, people switch mode as part of a journey sometimes. And there's a lot of variation between the demographic who carry risk in terms of the potential to be carrying the virus and the risks to themselves if they are infected, so the disease burden. And whilst ticketing and other data can tell us something about the journeys made, the end-to-end -end journey data is actually poor for quite a lot of settings. In terms of the epidemiological evidence that, that directly connects virus spread with the use of transport, I've put three examples here, two from China and one from Germany, and these are perhaps well-known examples. The first two are based on tracking, whilst the third uses correlation and association. And perhaps what's notable uh, is the range of difference in terms of the estimated risk coming out between the different studies. And the Dresler paper, uh, the second one there, questions whether outbreaks related to PT may be under-recorded because infections can't be identified and, of course, contacts can be difficult to trace. Some of the complex factors impacting on transmission on public transport are shown here, broadly separated into, into these two groups. In terms of the environment, it is a high occupancy density with close proximity, and it in, engenders con connectivity between a large number of people who are essentially strangers. There is limited abil ab ability for individuals to control the environment as well, especially the air. And it's a high touch frequency setting. And this is an issue for people who really do need to hold on, perhaps older people and people who are a little bit frail. And of course, there's that, that connectivity to hubs, including social spaces, food, drink, etc. But for many, it's an essential service, especially for those who work in more risky settings. And um, perhaps to note as well, it's a relatively sedentary setting, which could indicate lower aerosol emission. Against that background, I'll say something about the track project. So the track project of transport risk assessment for COVID knowledge, to give it its full name, started in September 2020 as a rapid response project. And in response to the initial stages of the pandemic in the UK, it's funded by the national uh, funding body. So actually, Professor Kath Noakes is PI for the project, and I'm leading one of the work packages, uh, which is concerned with understanding user behaviour and demographics. The main goal is to try and quantify the risk of infection that might be present in different surface public transport modes. And we're focusing particularly there on bus, train and metro, and also to explore uh, some of the evidence relating to mitigating actions. We've got a unifying model which sits over the whole of the work set of work packages, which considers three routes to infection. In other words, aerosol, close range and contact. And we've labelled this the TVC model, which I'll come back to later. Our different partners are also carrying out different packages of work, including uh, the UK Health Security Agency, who are doing some, cell, uh, some surface sampling, uh, analysis of CCTV data to characterise social distancing and surface contact patterns, and research to collect data and model environmental emissions, which I'll also come back to. But overall, we're taking this exposure-based approach to quantifying um, risk. But the question of who is using public transport is also an important part of the picture. And that means gathering and understanding of uh, the traveling public traveling public's characteristics, so their gender, their age, their ethnicity, their income level, but also the characteristics of the travel and the journey themselves, the trip purpose, the time of day, and more. 
these population and activity characteristics are really important because some parts of the population are more likely to be infected, um, for example, due to their occupation. We've collected over 560,000 individual trip traces, i.e. from the origin to destination with trajectory mode, contextual variables using a software app. And these high resolution mobility profiles are being used to provide realistic parameters to the overall risk model and some of our uh, individual behavioral modeling. We've also had an opportunity to understand some of the changing travel patterns through our close links with bus and train operators. Um, patronage is a sensitive topic in the UK, uh, but what we can see here is some anonymized data that's been given to us. Uh, this il illustrates here the percentage patronage levels against the baseline week, and do note this is for the first 15 months of the pandemic, but the broad tra trends are looking very similar um, across uh, the different um, uh, indicators that we've got here. So the 10th and the 90th percentile of the different routes for that operator, which is the gray area. And also uh, there isn't a great deal of difference between the, the, there are two pink lines on here, which is a solid pink and a, a dash pink, which is the difference between London and outside London. So all are following more or less the same um, trends. The Google mobility data for Leeds, which is down here, is city specific, city specific and relates to retail and recreational trips only. So we're just showing here discretionary trips. Um, and that was important because there were three lockdown periods showed by the pink shaded areas. And what we can see is some fatigue with uh, that lockdown process as, as we were coming towards the end of those periods. So in summary, quantifying the risk on public transport involves the modelling of multiple factors, which we've outlined here. The chance of an infected person being on public transport, the different ways that the virus can be transmitted, allowing for mitigations and behaviours. The exposure that the travelling public have to the virus, again li linked to these multiple factors, including the duration of the trip, proximity and more. And finally, the actual infection, infection process, including the dose, the variant, immunity, transmission route. So the track project team, uh, one of our, a couple of our partners have looked at ventilation as a particular way of measuring the potential pathway for airborne transmission. And this has involved instrumenting an intercity train carriage and using carbon dioxide and particulate measures as a, a proxy for rebreathed air. Uh, the the uh, wonderful picture we've got here of the instrumented uh, carriage has HVAC inlets at the sides of the carriage and then the outlet is running down the middle of the aisle there. This empirical data is complemented by some in-lab simulation and modeling work as well of the airflows. And the image below that um, is showing the circulation of air and increased velocity, particularly close to that HVAC system there, which is positioned on the ceiling. So uh, we can see as well an area in the middle of the carriage where, where there is very little air circulation. I should say that these are simulated uh, results that, that came out after about 30 minutes of, of simulation. But there are some practicalities of ventilation as well. So in terms of commuter train, bus and subway, this may be mechanical or natural. Uh, the, for the shorter journeys, ventilation may have less impact, but opening doors and windows can help. For the intercity train, these are usually longer journeys, so usually fully mechanical uh, vents. They're often with demand control. For long journeys, we believe ventilation is important and there is very little opportunity to increase that easily. This may be an issue of longer term redesign uh, in terms of the carriages and the ventilation system. But overall, challenges with power consumption where we've got competing demands on the power uh, that is supplied overall between the different systems. So to summarise that TVAC model, which is the overarching model that we were seeking to produce within the project, the TVAC, TVC stands for Transmission of Virus in Carriages, I should say, within the track model. And this is an agent-based subway stochastic model um, which, uh, in which the agents are passengers, uh, so they board and alight at different stops. 
This is a flow chart showing the general flow of the modeling work and the clear, clear boxes are the boxes where we've got parameters we can readily change and explore some scenarios. And the solid boxes there are some of the uh, outputs. So the loading patterns from empirical and come from empirical underground trips in London with a range of prevalence chosen. And this generates the chance of there just being an infected person in the carriage overall. The viral, the viral load is assumed to be fixed, as is respiratory activity between the agents. Um, and we assume droplets of different size are going to be exhaled, which input to a droplet model. Um, and uh, this generates the emission rate, the geometry, ventilation, masks, etc. These are all things that we can, parameters we can change and explore. And this finally results in the measure of exposure there based on close and long range exposure and format. So distributions of potential outcomes are derived from a large number of simulations. So these are stochastic projections. And um, the results, of course, are for the parameters that we've input. We have got various sources to fine tune those parameters including survey data from the project and the opportunity to interface with our work package three model which will work at a lower level of resolution linking home travel to destinations school office and supermarket and the return journey some of the key findings i've highlighted there so predicted risk of exposure is seen to be overall low but prevalence and loading dominant factors uh, in terms of the highest doses, well, there is a small percentage of people in close proximity to the infected uh, person who are most at risk. And there is a small percentage of people who could get a high formite dose from contaminated surfaces. In general, long range airborne exposure uh, is likely to be low with a shorter journey and high ventilation rate. But note uh, at the end there that masks can uh, reduce all of the transmission routes. We have done some work as well in terms of understanding whether we can estimate relative airborne risk. And this is a broader question. So what is the risk on transport with respect to other settings, for example, office, supermarket, schools? Comparisons are difficult due to variations in mode of transmission, the time spent in the setting, different behaviours, et cetera, et cetera. But the results here are summarising a comparison based on airborne risk between a person being in a train for one hour with uh, quite a high number of people or being in the office for eight hours with rather uh, few people. And the quantum rate there is the number of infectious uh, particles needed to infect a susceptible person. So we've got two scenarios, uh, one quite low and one uh, much higher. The overall finding from this, the risk of being in the office for eight hours with 40 people, uh, the risk of infections around six times that of being on a train for one hour. And of course, uh, these are just example scenarios and contexts which could be very different in real life. So the learning so far, individual risk is likely to be low, especially on short journeys. The population risk is increasing with the number of journeys taken, of course prevalence and loading likely to dominate the risk and uh, close range airborne transmission can happen anywhere people are in proximity. Of course, that will be higher with increased loading. Formite transmission probably low, but high surface touching, which we get with some people and in some uh, contexts could increase risks. And long range airborne transmission likely to be most important on long distance journeys. We've identified a couple of uh, knowledge gaps and a couple of areas to highlight here. Actual transmission on public transport is still extremely challenging to measure, uh, hence the exposure approach that we took and which other researchers have taken. There is a need for improved knowledge on public transport risks versus other environments. But a fundamental question which came through in one of our workshops with stakeholders of what is safe air quality on ground public transport and as by safe we need to uh, look at some of the trade-offs between communicable disease and some of the other safety risks that can occur um, on this type of transport so leading finally to whether air quality can be improved with other operational constraints such as energy efficiency temperature etc 
just uh, to say a few words about mitigating actions. And these can be separated into policy or operator kind of actions versus those for the individual. And many of these appear to be good common sense and, and are fairly well established through other research. So uh, good ventilation, strategies to reduce vi uh, viral uh, presence, test in isolation, provision of uh, hygiene facilities, Ticketing strategies to minimize crowding, this is an interesting one. And uh, but overall, a, a sense that maybe cleaning may be less important than it was perceived to be at the start of the pandemic. And for the individual, key is to avoid travel when sick, but wearing face coverings, good hygiene, keeping the windows open where possible, and supporting social distancing as well. So uh, thank you to all. A final thank you to the track team, but also the Department for Transport uh, colleagues who have given us terrific support, support from transport operators and stakeholder groups. And this is a couple of uh, absolutely key publications that relate to the work I've presented today. Lots more scientific detail and uh, very provoking and uh, uh, terrific uh, papers to look into if anyone would like to know more. Okay. Thank you very much, Susan, for that. And thank you for the, the sort of overview of the breadth there and, and what you've uh, highlighted. I'm going to go straight on to our next speaker, who is Jodie Holton. Uh, Jodie's the Chief Planning and Strategy Officer at the South Eastern Pennsylvania Transport Authority. And her title is entitled Sector Forward, uh, Response to and Ridership Recovery from the Pandemic. So over to you, Jodie. You want to unmute and share your screen. All right, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. I'm going to try to share my screen here. Um, That's great, we've got that. You got it. Now I'll turn it to full screen. Does that help? Perfect. Okay, great. Well, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, I wanted to, to give you a perspective of uh, SEPTA, which is the Southeastern Pennsylvania Transport Authority, and we serve Philadelphia, the Philadelphia region. It's a five county region, um, and give you a sense of uh, how large our public transportation authority is. We are the fifth largest in the United States. We have as you can see here, 2,800 vehicles that we maintain and operate with our customers. We have over 200, almost uh, 300 subway and rail stations that we manage. Uh, we have 9,300 employees that uh, we aim to keep safe every day. And um, we have a number of routes throughout the region. And was mentioned before, we are similar to other public transit agencies in that our ridership uh, has higher percentages of people of color. We have higher percentage of people with lower income. We have higher percentage of seniors um, in than our population in general in the region. So we are serving and providing um, equitable transportation options, affordable options that is that are reliable and safe um, for the Philadelphia region. And this gives you a sense of the scale of the region here in Philadelphia. This is showing the density of population and employment in, in the Philadelphia region and then how we serve that, that, um, that population with rail and bus um, uh, service as well as subway and elevated service. To give you a sense of where our ridership has been and where it is now and hopefully where it's going, um, the red line here is uh, 2020. Um, so in April, we hit our low of about 19% of, of pre-COVID ridership. We serve about a million uh, rides a day pre-pandemic. Um, and today we have reached about 616,000 uh, trips per day. Um, in the region. And you can see how for the last year or so in 2021, until the beginning of 2022, we were hovering between 30 and 50% of pre-COVID ridership. And of course, we started out 2020 with the Omicron virus uh, or the Omicron variant. So um, that reduced our ridership in the beginning of 2022. But we are now at um, our highest ridership since the pandemic began. 
at 57% of pre-COVID ridership. Um, and you can see that here, we have 616,000 uh, uh, trips per day. We continue to operate as much service as we can. Um, and we, we had done that through the pandemic to make sure that we were allowing uh, distance for social or uh, social distancing, um, you know, trying to get to that six feet between uh, passengers or just give people more uh, room on our vehicles. So we have put out um, almost 90% of pre-pandemic uh, transit uh, service. And then on our commuter rail or our regional rail, as we call it here in Philadelphia, we are currently operating 77% of pre-COVID ridership. So that has reduced the instance of crowding on any of our vehicles, um, but we are a public transport company and uh, mass transit and mass uh, moving a lot of people is, is what we're set up to do. Um, we've been surveying our customers uh, since the beginning of the pandemic quarterly, and we keep a pulse on, on what concerns them, what, um, what would bring them back to riding transit. And a lot of people cite, of course, their ability to work from home. They have flexible work schedules now. Um, they think that the service is uh, not as frequent as it used to be pre-pandemic. And to, to some extent, as I just said, that is, that is somewhat true. Um, and safety concerns. So safety concerns used to be a little bit more about COVID and about um, uh, public health concerns like that. But now um, through the pandemic, we did have an uptick in the number of vulnerable people or homeless or um, those who are addicted uh, to drugs riding the system and a fear of crime has become um, a significant concern as well. So during the pandemic, uh, what did we do to um, improve our cleaning and air quality? We definitely have established relationships with our uh, local universities, Drexel University, to talk about uh, air exchange in our vehicles and air quality throughout our system. Uh, we've installed uh, filters, the MERV 13 filters. We've uh, tested our air exchange rates on our, our vehicles and assured that it's every two to three minutes we are having a, an exchange of fresh air. We've also um, revamped our, our cleaning procedures. And every 10 days, all of our vehicles got a deep clean every night and uh, throughout the day um, as, as the vehicles come through our, our shops and yards, uh, they are wiped down and using our EPA approved disinfectants that uh, we went through somewhat of a long period of testing with them and then ended up with uh, two that we had already been using, the Avastat D and, and Lemon Skies disinfectants that are EPA approved. We also committed to hiring 200 more cleaners. Um, we are still in the process of hiring them. I think everybody's aware of the labor shortage right now. Um, but we we have budgeted and and uh, put those heads in place so that we can hire um, and maintain that cleaning protocol that was established during COVID. It's been a big mission for us to communicate this with the public um, so that they're aware of everything that we're doing and that it is as safe as as it can be to um, use public transit. One of the things we did during the pandemic was develop a um, a, a vehicle capacity dashboard so that people could look at historic or a ridership over the last couple of weeks and see how likely it was that their vehicle would be crowded. Um, less and less that's become, you know, not something that people go to as much any, uh, anymore, but it was useful during the time when people were very interested in, in uh, distancing. Uh, and how did we protect our employees? Uh, we installed operator shields on every vehicle. So every vehicle where the um, operator has contact with the public had a plexiglass shield installed. Um, we distributed masks and held many vaccination clinics. Uh, we offered free testing for COVID. We formed partnerships again with our trusted community organizations such as the Black Doctors COVID Consortium uh, to help uh, build awareness and, um, and 
uh, communicate that we had these resources available. In 2021, uh, we, we adopted a strategic plan, um, really setting the framework for how we can transform uh, our ridership, our service uh, patterns, our organization to be more responsive to, to uh, the changing needs of, of, of the region. Um, and we developed uh, a num three goals to be a proactive organization, to provide service that is intuitive and is for everyone, and then to provide a more seamless transit network. As part of uh, providing a, a intuitive system and one that is um, uh, useful to all, as well as being proactive, we developed an internal program called SCOPE, which stands for Safety, Cleaning, Ownership, Partnership, and Engagement. And it's a combination of all these new um, codifying and making a standard, our new cleaning procedures, um, we partnered as well with universities such as Cabrini and Temple University in Philadelphia to provide additional ambassadors that go out uh, with our police officers and, and on their own to provide health and human services assistance to those in need in our stations and on our facilities. And I mentioned the rising concern about crime and the perception of crime and you know, as ridership comes back, the incidents and the um, uh, the amount of crime on our system has dropped uh, by thirty percent. So, so some of that is uh, due to the fact that we have uh, been hiring more police officers. We've partnered with security, um, private security companies, uh, and developed that ambassador program uh, with where we have the health and human services support um, uh, that ride along with our transit police. We've, all, we've also um, highly publicized our transit watch app so that you can report anything on the system discreetly and have a response. Um, we've also done um, worked on our fare system so that it's more flexible and uh, affordable for those who need it the most. Um, we offer free transfers now between our modes, children ride free under 12, and uh, we developed a flexible um, three-day pass and, and variations of that. Uh, one of the, the things that we noticed during the pandemic was that you know, more and more people were using our SEPTA key, which is our, um, our contactless uh, fare payment system. Uh, we, we are allowing, um, mobile ticketing later this year. Uh, we're piling it right now. Um, and then we've also developed a program called Key Advantage where our major employers can sign up and pay a very flat and base rate for all of their employees to have access to um, an anywhere pass on transit. So much like a company pays for health insurance for all their employees or, or, or cost shares with their employees for that benefit, uh, they can also do that now for, for transit. So these are ways that in which we're trying to build back our ridership and um, make it uh, more useful to more people. Uh, we also have a wayfinding and branding program going on so that people feel more um, comfortable and have a better understanding of, of our system and where they're going when they're in a station. Uh, we found that people get uh, uh, nervous and fear and more have more concerns over safety when it is unclear where they're going. So wayfinding and um, branding has been an important part of uh, our strategic plan. We also understand that ridership is, has changed and we, we don't all commute from nine to five anymore, not every day. People use transit in the Philadelphia region for a variety of trips already. Um, so we're looking at all of our service, whether it's regional rail or commuter rail and our bus network to make sure that we're providing service throughout the weekday, uh, around the clock and on the weekends in a way that gets everybody to work and to their daily activities. Um, throughout the pandemic, of course, we had a lot of essential workers that were riding on our system and they do so at 
vary at a variety of different times, whether it's shifts that start at 6 a.m. or, or 1 p.m. Uh, we have a lot of um, service out there and we've been calling it flattening the peak, but providing that service consistently throughout the day and starting as early and as late at night as we can. And I'll just end with, with this slide. There's a lot of numbers on here, um, but this is a showing our operating budget. And the black is the one-time subsidy that we've received from the federal government to uh, for our operating budget to make up for that fair revenue that we have lost uh, during the pandemic. You can see the green bars at the bottom. Those are our fair revenue pre-COVID was about over 500 million a year. And just this year, this fiscal year, we expect to have about 316 million in fair revenue. We still have a gap and we're dependent on that, that uh, COVID relief from the federal government making up 416 million of our operating budget. By doing that, that allows us to run a lot of service um, so that we're providing those essential, this essential service to the public. Unfortunately, as we move forward and forecast out into the future, we don't see ridership coming back to pre-COVID levels um, anytime soon. We do expect it to increase, but uh, we will still have a budget gap. And of course, all the cleaning and the security that we've provided uh, has, has uh, increased the expenses in our operating budget. Um, so we want to continue to, to provide those services, uh, but again, this puts us in a, in a compromising situation with our, our budget, highly dependent on fair revenue. So I'll, I'll leave you with that. And um, that's, our, that's the perspective we've had for the last couple of years in, in, uh, in Philadelphia riding through the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Jody. That was great to, to see and to see that real perspective of, um, you know, from an operator and the challenges that you, you face and are still facing there. Um, OK, we're going to move now into a panel discussion. And before we go into that detailed discussion, I'd like to introduce uh, our panellists, so as well as, as Dr. Grant Muller and Ms. Holton, who've already talked today, I want to introduce Madeline Parker, who's a PhD candidate at the University of California, Berkeley, and Dr. Jason McGraw, who's a researcher at the Oak Ridge National Lab. So before I go to questions for everybody, I'd just like to invite uh, our two new panellists, uh, Madeline and Jason, to just give a, a, a few minutes, um, a couple of minutes, just to sort of say who you are and your some, some thoughts that you've got around this area. So Madeline, should we go over to you first, please? Thank you. Good afternoon, and it's a, a pleasure to be here and to join these excellent presentations. I'm going to speak very briefly on research I conducted with a team at UC Berkeley on the impacts of COVID-19 on transit riders. So in this work, we studied GPS travel data in combination with multiple waves of surveys of panelists across the United States from August 2020 to October 2022. And we found in our 2020 research that the travel patterns of transit riders, as one would expect, um, were much more significantly disrupted by the pandemic than the travel of non-riders. So through the end of 2020, transit riders reduced their travel by about 50% more than non-riders, um, even when controlling for other factors. And three quarters of transit riders reported taking transit less since the pandemic. This is likely due to a combination of being affected by transit service reductions, concerns about infection risk on transit, and trip reductions due to the pandemic. The combination of fears of virus transmission and transit service reductions affected over 90% of transit riders in our study. Less than 10% of, of riders um, reported that they were comfortable using transit despite infection risk and, and weren't affected by transit service reductions. So the top factors that riders described would increase their use of transit. Um, this was back in the end of 2020, described as um, first widespread use of face masks, followed by increased sanitation and cleaning, an, affected, an effective COVID-19 treatment or vaccine, reduction of COVID-19 rates in the area and reduced crowding. Riders also cited that they would take transit more with a return to regular service levels or schedule frequency. 
And comparing these results from 2020 to two years later in our, in our very recent October 2022 survey, the percent of respondents who said that they were comfortable taking transit increased from around 10% to 20%, but a significant portion still described that reduced crowding, a widespread use of face masks, and increased sanitation and cleaning would increase their use of transit. Um, so we really found that riders are still very hesitant to use transit due to concerns about COVID-19 transmission um, and their travel patterns have been impacted as a result of that. And I'll pass it over to Jason. Thank you, Madeline. Um, so I'm going to do Jason now. Thank you. Also, also glad to be here. Um, <clears throat> hopefully my internet connection will hold. They have come to bury the line again. So I've been dropping on and off. Um, <clears throat> I was a member of the ASHRAE Academic Task Force, so I wanted to say a little bit about that. Um, I was the lead of the transportation subgroup where we put together some transportation guidance. <laughs> Looking through the, the uh, attendance list, I saw at least one person from that group, so gratifying to see him here. Um, we had, in a very short time, put together um, guidance for multi-modes of trans transport. And I think one of the things that we found that has been echoed in, in the takeaways from the previous workshops is that variability in, particularly in, in public transportation is, is very important and, and presents a very difficult problem. The concerns for one transportation authority in one part of our world can be very different <clears throat> than those from, from other parts of the world. And it can be, as, as was noted in um, the, the first presentation, that the demographics play a role, the, there's variation within the modes themselves, and there's the difference between the modes. One of the things that we did encounter in putting together our transportation guidance was that uh, many people in the HVAC in our world wanted to treat transportation cabins as just little moving buildings. And that's just not very appropriate. And while there are things that are similar, there are more things that are different. And that is, is can be difficult for us HVAC guys to get around because, you know, we kind of tend to think very highly of ourselves. So um, one of the things <clears throat> that I hope that people take away from this session today is that even though there is a lot of variability, even though there are very difficult problems here, there are things that can be done to mitigate these impacts. Now, you know, there are, we, we can't control everything obviously, but with proper guidance, I do believe that, you know, we should be better prepared for the, the next time. Hopefully not in my lifetime, but you know, if that next time does come, I, I, I think we have learned things and there are paths forward. So thank you. I'll said my piece there and hand it back over. Okay, thank you very much for that, Jason. Um, and thank you for the introductions from both yourself and Madam there. So Pat, I, I, we've got quite a number of questions from the public, but I want to just start by a question that perhaps we haven't touched on yet in the presentations. Ventilation has been highlighted as a measure that's important, but we haven't set, touched on air cleaning. And I wonder whether any members of the panel had any thoughts on whether air cleaning strategies do have a place in public transport and if so whether they might be a, a short-term fix or a long-term solution um i don't know whether anybody would like to to tackle that one at all i don't i know jason you mentioned hvac and wonder whether you come across that with ashray yeah so um within the membership of ashray there were plenty of people that sent us recommendations oh we need to we need to we need to do air cleaning you should do air cleaning you need to use uv you need to do these different things I, I do think there is a place for air cleaning in the transportation sector, particularly public transportation, not just in the cabins, but also in the in stations and things like that. Um, but it has to be done carefully and it shouldn't be done in an ad hoc way. It has to be done deliberately and carefully with engaging with the appropriate expertise, particularly with cabins. You, you do not wish to be introducing things into that space that can be dangerous. You know, it's not the same thing. If a rooftop unit catches on fire, that's very bad, but you know, that's, it's up on top of the building, there are their chances to, to do something different. If a similar thing happens with a bus that's in a tunnel, it's a whole different deal. So one of the things that we hit on hard with our guidance was yes, do these things, consider these things, but always do it with the proper guidance. That's great, thank you. And uh, Jody, I don't know whether you wanted to comment at all from the perspective of an, of an operator here whether this had come across your desk. 
Yeah, I think we we did. Um, it, uh, I guess experiment I, maybe would be the right way to say it with um, UV um, uh, cleaning. Uh, but then we pretty much have have uh, gone with just installing MERV 13 filters on, especially for our bus fleet. Uh, they, we found them that fit in the ventilation equipment and um, and that seemed to be the best route for us to go. That's great, thank you. Um, so perhaps I'll direct the next question to, to perhaps Madeline and to Susan about what do you think might be some of the barriers to implementing uh, best practice in public transport from, from the, some of the things you've come across, whether that's about individual behaviour or whether it's about the sort of more um, structural things that can be done. Um, I don't know whether... I can just speak very briefly on the, the behavior side. One factor that came up frequently in, in our research was just masking and the ways that that can both sort of increase perceptions of safety as well as, um, I think it's Susan mentioned in her presentation, actual safety, but um, definitely are concerns in different locations in the US and parts of locations just about um, enforcement of mask mandates um, and other sort of behavioral factors around those as well. Thanks for that. Susan, do you want to comment on anything around barriers? Yes, I'll just um, add to that actually because um, I was very, very interested by uh, very interested by your your remarks, uh, Madeline. Very similar to some of the findings we've had through alongside the monitoring work, we've done some focus groups to understand uh, people's perceptions, and uh, we've collected perceptions over time as well. And particularly during the pandemic, the heat of the the pan pandemic in the UK, there was a lot of uh, anger let's say and frustration amongst the traveling public that uh, it wasn't possible to enforce mask wearing and there are all sorts of practical reasons uh, why that actually was the case but this created um, a, a kind of a split between the demographic between people who were very keen to have mask wearing um, uh, enforced on their journeys and those who were actually very keen to be able to exercise their right not to not to wear one or what they perceive to be their, their right and of course in the middle of all this uh, maybe the service staff on the trains and the buses uh, themselves who are in a very difficult uh, position they have to con concern about their own safety but how to deal with uh, these competing views between people as they travel that's great thank you Susan um, so we, I will jump into some of the questions that have come through to us on Slido now so um, the first one I'd like to ask is you know, we focus very much on public transit here but how do we think some of these results might be useful to say school buses um, for example, school buses, children in rural areas might have quite long bus runs. Um, they might be children with disabilities. They're on those buses twice a day. Um, would anybody like to comment around that? I'd be happy to say that, that variability is going to play a very big role there. Uh, you have a lot of variation with those vehicles and is going to be thus therefore very difficult to make sort of general statements about there may still be some, but because of just the variability of those, of the models, age, all that, all those things all will play a role and that's going to be very important. Yeah. Do you want to comment as well, Susan? Yeah, I'll, I'll just maybe step in to say, I think that the longer journeys are a little bit of a, a concern, that um, maybe the uh, the quality of the buses could or could not be the same. Um, so maybe some of the engineering aspects are not quite that different. But what will be different is the behaviour of those uh, students on the buses to compared with the general population. So there is more likely to be uh, activities such as uh, maybe shouting conversation, maybe people, uh, uh, young people getting up a little bit, moving around, turning around, speaking with people around them. And all those activities actually can raise can raise the risk. So I think that um, similar kinds of studies could focus directly on the school buses, but we would expect to get maybe some different types of risk coming out. Great, thank you. I think this next one's really for, for Jody. I'm gonna combine a couple of questions here, which is as a, as a passenger, how can they find out what the ventilation standards are on a particular uh, bus or a train? And is there any sort of website where you show that that um, 
vehicles have the high air changes, um, you know, and what sort of in interventions have been put in place there? Yes, uh, we, you know, over the last uh, couple of years, as we've, you know, installed different different filters, we've uh, put together a toolkit for our employers because it was important for them when they brought back their employees to to tell them that the public transport was safe or safer uh, way to get to work. And so we have it on our website. Um, iSEPTA Philly, and then also just SEPTA.org um, under the employer toolkit, uh, you can see the just the two to three uh, minute exchange rate and then the, the MERV 13 filters. I don't think we break it down by vehicle, um, but that's a good suggestion. We can put that up there. I, I think a related question about kinds of dashboards that are available and perhaps as to what is already available, perhaps also to the, the panelists here about what could be available, you think? Well, I had mentioned the, the crowding dashboard. So the number of riders that you can typically expect on a certain route on a certain day um, or time of day. Um, and that's available on our website as well, just septa.org. Um, and it's on the left-hand side of the, the webpage. Uh, we do, we have um, our ridership by route and all that as a dashboard on our uh, SEPTA website as well. Okay. Um, perhaps I could ask this, um, perhaps either to Jason or to Susan here around. Uh, Susan, you highlighted dead zones for ventilation. Do we know if, if these might be mitigated by passenger movement? Um, and how does that influence air circulation? And are we looking at this? You're on mute, Susan. <laughs> oh dear, sorry about that. Yes, I think that um, the, the the study that we looked at that was looked at within um, track, which was Hugh Woodward's, um, well, the reference I gave at the end. Um, I believe that he did look at uh, the potential for people who were standing up and moving, created some stir in terms of uh, the air airflow, etc. So I think that there is um, an opportunity to look at this in a little a little bit more detail. But those findings were very clear, actually, that showed on that slide that there is definitely that that dead zone, and that must be a little bit of a concern, particularly on the long distance journeys. Yeah, and brother Jason, I don't know whether you might be able to think, is this anything, something that some of the ASHRAE work has looked at at all, about the mixing of um, Yeah, there are different expectations, different vehicles with, with how movement is going to play a role. I mean, obviously, this, this is, we're talking about public transportation today, but obviously with, 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 with airplanes, you don't move around very much. With, you know, trains and, and buses, you may move around somewhat more. So there is, again, variability. Um, we did find in some other unrelated research that movement would basically play a pretty big role in, in how much of a space you could you could fill with potentially um, infectious particles, though. So I would expect that movement would play a big role. Great, thank you. Um, and perhaps I, I'd like to ask this one to Madeline um, about the equitability of it. So, you know, if we're trying to improve indoor air management and public transport, how can we do this in a in an equitable way? Thank you. I think that in order to really ensure that these improvements are equitable, it's important to both consider the most crowded modes. So, for example, we know that bus ridership is closer to pre-pandemic levels than, say, commuter rail. Um, and also to make sure that any improvements in filtration are making their way to all public transit modes, including ADA paratransit service for people with disabilities. Um, and building on Jody, what Jody was describing earlier in terms of communication, just to make sure that um, there is broad communication to make sure that that passengers feel safe taking transit um, and that sort of as spoken as a personal um, transit writer myself, I've seen a lot of variation um, in information about um, safety measures across different transit systems. That's great. Um, I think the last question I'm going to ask here is, um, I think around the, 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 the use of different methods. So for example, there's, there's still quite a bit of focus it seems from the public um, that surface cleaning is important, yet a lot of the evidence is suggesting that that is of lower priority. And I'm wondering whether how how can this be balanced and is there, do we think actually 
that surface cleaning might be something that, that could be reduced, particularly given around budgetary constraints. If anyone's keen to comment on that. I'll just I'll just quickly comment, uh, Kappa. I think it's a question of public confidence um, and people like to see a clean environment and that is attractive to to the right to the ridership. Um, I think it's also the case that there, there can be some practical issues around cleaning, perhaps as much as as people might want, as some of the service operators might want to, to be able to clean. It is expensive and practically very, very difficult, particularly when there are some very quick turnarounds in terms of uh, passengers getting on and getting off and vehicles being reused, etc. So I think it needs looking at a little bit more. That's great. And I don't know whether Jodie you wanted to comment from her. Yeah. I think from our perspective, we're going to keep up the cleaning uh, protocols that we have right now, but um, just because it does help people feel like the system is safe, it's a perception issue, I think, more than anything else. But I hope, you know, maybe a year from now, we can slow up on disinfecting every handrail we see uh, every <laughs> twice a day. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I agree. I think I think I mean certainly a lot of the stuff we've looked at would suggest that hand hygiene. If, if, if the the risks off off surfaces are quite low, but what little risk there is there, hand hygiene might be the better route um, than the surface cleaning. But at the same, you're right; it's the public perception. So I'm going to try to, I'd say thank you to all of our speakers and panelists today um, for feeding into this. It's a very big topic, and we have only just scratched the surface of it. Um, it will allow us to move very nicely into the next sessions. Um, you know, so thank you for the thoughtful presentations, the thoughtful responses to questions in here. Um, I think for me, some of the take home from this is that um, public transport is a, a complex environment. It's an environment where, as I think Jason put it, it's, they're not mini buildings. And we need to think about that in, in in the, the, the specifics of what happens in those environments, the fact that people are in much closer proximity perhaps than in other environments and close proximity, you know, things like ventilation are important, but they, they won't mitigate everything because of that, because of the close proximity there. I think one of the things that's came out, come out very clearly here is that public transport is, it's a necessary um, environment for many people. Um, and that's not necessarily equitably distributed. The, the people who probably have the most choice about how they travel are those who have the most resource, um, those who often have no choice but to use public transportation are often those who have the least and are probably having to deal with other inequities um, in, their, in their lives as well and, and how they live. There is a massive aspect around public confidence and public perception um, and we need to think about how the communications we do around transmission relate to that because not it doesn't always necessarily tie up to what is the most important route of transmission but at the same time public perception and confidence um, is very important in there. So um, for me, those were some of the, the take home environments. It's a complex setting um, and every public transport mode is different and there will be different challenges in different places. So thank you again to everybody on our panel um, for giving your time and thoughts for this. And I'm going to hand over now to session two, which will be moderated by uh, Dr. Lucas Rocha Malonga. Right. Thank you, Kath. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the second session of today's workshop. Uh, I am Lucas, and I'm a senior health scientist at ICF, where I work on environmental epidemiology consulting projects for federal agencies in the US. Eric, if you could show the uh, speakers, please. Thank you. Um, on the screen, you can see the names of the speakers we have lined up for the session. The goal of this second session is to highlight a set of case studies in different geographic locations where participants work directly with local communities during the pandemic. These participants will discuss their experience balancing the safety of riders and transport workers 
while navigating external expectations, imposed policies, and technologies with varying levels of proven efficacy. Our first case study is titled COVID-19 Research Driven by Public Transit and University Partnerships. This is a case study of a SEPTA Drexel University collaboration in Philadelphia that will be presented by Dr. Christopher Sales, Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Drexel University. To our audience, please visit the event's website to find all the speakers and panelists' bios. To our speakers, please remember that you have seven to 10 minutes for your presentations. A two minute warning will be posted on the chat. Chris, please turn on your camera and mute and share your screen. The floor is yours. Thank you, Lucas. Let me share my screen. Get it into the screen mode and switch screens. All right, thank you for the introduction, uh, Lucas. Uh, I really glad like the, the first session. So I'll talk to about today about our SEPTA Drexel collaboration, our partnership uh, in the city of Philadelphia. And I'll be using the STAR Plus story format to tell you the situation, the tasks that we undertook, uh, actions we did, and some of the results that we're getting and then the future next steps um, for the collaboration. Um, but before I start, I really wanted to acknowledge Jim Fox, who is formerly the Assistant General Manager of Systems Safety at SEPTA, um, who is uh, very critical in, in this collaboration, this partnership between Drexel University and SEPTA in Philadelphia. So we heard from Jody, if you were in the first uh, session, that in the spring of 2020, um, there is just a major shutdown across the world in cities and, and, and public transits across the world uh, face these shutdowns. Um, nobody was going to work. Uh, and a lot of these services, these public transit agencies uh, saw ridership drop um, down into the teens. Um, and even now, a few years later, since the start of the pandemic, we're still uh, at some places uh, only up to about 50 to 60% ridership. And so really at this time, SEPTA was concerned about um, how could they get ridership back uh, to get that revenue that's needed uh, and, and build confidence that it's safe to ride public transit. Um, they were, um, as described by Jody, uh, they had some cleaning protocols and a lot of it was you know, visual to, to, to appease kind of um, the ridership, their, their perception uh, of how clean um, riding on public transit was. So a lot of it was focused on, on surface cleaning um, also enforcing masks, uh, those mask mandates uh, on transit vehicles, as well as that social distancing uh, on, on, on board these public transit systems where really the purpose is actually to carry a lot of people. So that, that was often, often difficult. So the task um, that we undertook in spring of 2020, uh, it was actually spawned uh, by a small business, uh, A Plasma, uh, and, and they talked to some people at SEPTA and brought us on board brought Drexel researchers on board uh, to discuss with SEPTA their concerns about the effect of the pandemic on uh, the public transit system in the Philadelphia region. And so a few weeks later, uh, in May 27, 2020, we actually took a tour of their Frankfurt Transportation Center. We got to see uh, their workers who are still working, even though it was pretty much the start of the pandemic, cleaning the buses and trying to maintain them for, for public use. Um, and then eventually, in, in the middle of the summer of 2020, uh, we proposed a, a partnership between SEPTA and Drexel to bring together the expertise of researchers across the university from the College of Medicine, College of Engineering, School of Public Health, Nursing, even Criminology, and the School of Business to try to help SEPTA out um, with what they were dealing with with the COVID-19 pandemic. And so part of this partnership in that memo, uh, we really wanted to analyze customer perceptions that limited their use a public transit and determine what factors uh, that reduce the reluctance to ride uh, mass transit. We also wanted to examine potential exposure scenarios and risks, um, mainly related to airborne transmission, as well as contaminated surfaces, um, using indoor air modeling, air quality modeling, with a quantitative microbial risk assessment framework to determine what the most significant risks were or could be. And then we also wanted to validate indicators. So I think at that time, there was a lot of companies trying to sell disinfection technologies um, that could be effective at decontaminating um, buses and vehicles, but we wanted to assess whether those indicators that they were reporting uh, in their flyers, um, kind of selling those, the, the, those technologies, if they're actually effective. 
Um, so we wanted to provide agencies with methods to generate qualitative and quantitative data uh, that they can use and share with the public to ensure that it's safe to ride mass transit. And lastly, we wanted to develop and test um, different disinfection technologies and risk mitigation strategies, whether they're masking or improved ventilation, and how it could be used, it could be used to reduce COVID-19 transmission, not only for the public, but also uh, for the employees of SEPTA or other public transit agencies. So the actions that we took um, after setting up that uh, memo and the partnership uh, was to bring together Drexel researchers, uh, staff members uh, from SEPTA, or their vehicle engineers, uh, their safety specialists, um, even their uh, data informatics people that can get data on ridership, uh, bring them together and to figure out ways we can address um, their issues with uh, dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it, because of the university and SEPTA being a big agency, it did take a while for an MOU to get in place, um, but not soon after, not too long after, um, there was a call by the Federal Transit Administration for us to actually, as researchers, uh, work with SEPTA to apply for some COVID-19 funding um, from the Department of Transportation, uh, specifically the Federal Transit Administration. And so I won't read this entire slide, but in November of 2020, um, the FTA put out uh, a pro, uh, funding opportunity announcement um, called Public Transportation COVID-19 Research Demonstration Grant Program. And when we looked at what they were looking at, at uh, for these, these uh, proposals, uh, we really keyed in on vehicle facility equipment and infrastructure cleaning and disinfection, as well as exposure mitigation measures. So we actually put together a proposal, a team of uh, researchers from Drexel, as well as SEPTA, uh, SEPTA submitted the proposal uh, in November 2020, and we actually heard in January of 21, 2021 uh, that we received funding from um, DOT uh, for this COVID-19 project. And there was 37 projects nationwide uh, funded by this funding opportunity uh, at that time. It took a while for us to get contracted, but uh, we started doing research, literature research, and, and eventually we started making headway on the project. And the proposed project framework that we came up with is really built around simulations. So doing cabin-wide well-mixed model simulations, so indoor air quality models uh, of, of aerosols that might contain SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, as well as close range uh, computational fluid dynamic models or CFD model simulations. And then to feed into that, those simulations, we had to get information from SEPTA, um, on vehicle routes, riderships, mask wearing, and, and social distancing compliance. So they actually have some videos uh, and, and recorded information on you know, what proportion, what portion of, of, of riders were wearing masks and such. And we also wanted to conduct uh, laboratory testing of different air purific purification technologies uh, that would be advertised and, and, and trying to be sold to uh, mass transit agencies. And we also wanted to do some cabin testing uh, to refine some of the ventilation rate calculations that we're inputting into some of these models. And from that, we wanted to do a cost benefit analysis to figure out which strategies were the best um, uh, for public transit agency to adapt uh, to reduce COVID-19 transmission and eventually kind of make some reports and recommendations to the industry based on our, our project. So we didn't get funded to do the cost benefit analysis, but we're still, you know, those are just common, just things that are gonna come out of what we do um, automatically or just by default uh, to some degree. We might be able to not do the, the kind of economic cost benefit analysis um, that we wanted to, but we'll still at least come up with some hopefully good recommendations and guidance uh, for the industry. So some results to date. Um, we've been trying to derive um, COVID-19 risks on board SEPTA vehicles. And like I said, our, one of our approaches is using that well-mixed indoor air quality box model. So trying to figure out model sources, um, how things might be removed um, from these vehicles. And so these well-mixed models uh, help determine volume average concentrations and estimate risks, average risks uh, on, on vehicle journeys. And so the simulations can be scaled up and adapted to a wide variety of different vehicles and routes and also engineering controls, whether they have MERV 8 filters, MERV 13 filters, or maybe if there's no, uh, the HVAC system isn't on. And then we also wanted to, on these trips, these, these uh, uh, routes, try to assess the evolution of risk over time during those trips. Um, so we're able to determine the infectious particle concentration uh, based on a number of uh, factors, including the occupancy and 
the percent infected based on community uh, infection rates. And so this is really useful for statistical examination uh, of the outcomes. And I really have to have a shout out for Brian and Cummings and Professor Waring, as well as Professor Haas, um, who are leading these efforts uh, on this well-mixed indoor air quality box models. Now, some results um, from, from this first approach, these well-mixed models. Uh, we've been able to produce a lot of data from these stochastic models, these Monte Carlo um, models. Um, so for instance, we're able to assess the impact of HVAC operation uh, on the system. So I think I saw one of the questions on, you know, we, you're, you're, if you sit on, on buses or on subway cars, it doesn't always seem like the air is always on, uh, even though they're designed to be on uh, and they have certain kind of engineering design criteria. And so we can actually assess what happens when the fan is off or really what the effectiveness, effectiveness uh, is of going from MERV 8 to MERV 13 filters. And then we can also perform some sensitivity analyses to figure out what factors either strongly increase risk of COVID-19 transmission or, or, or lower the risk. And we're finding that it really relates to this hierarchy of controls. So for instance, um, you know, having the number of fraction of passengers that are masked strongly uh, affects, uh, lowers the risk uh, of COVID-19 transmission. And we also see that there's engineering controls, things that maybe uh, SEPTA or other public transit agencies can do um, to, to modify, for instance, the recirculation rate if they can, um, the types of filters, the HVAC filter efficiency, and also the, the ventilation rates can also strongly lower the risk. And we've even seen that um, if you actually have good N95 fitted masks on operators, they can significantly reduce uh, 10 to 100 times the risk uh, of COVID-19 transmission. We've also had another approach using CFD modeling simulations, and this is led by Professor James Lowe uh, and his PhD student Zainab um, at Drexel University. And we're trying to track the distribution of aeros aerosol particles inside of vehicles. Um, and we can run simulations very on, very, uh, on, based on ventilation rate, ventilation flow rate, the number of infectious emitters, and how they're grouped and distributed throughout the vehicle. So it's kind of hard to see in the, in the figure, um, but we're seeing that if you're seated in between possibly an infected rider, that between the infected rider and the intake, uh, the return for the HVAC systems, sometimes those particles that might be carried that are infectious um, could run towards you if you're kind of sitting in between those two places. Um, we also see dead zones, which I saw questions about as well. Uh, and then we're also looking at the relative risks in, in the breathing zone of each seated passenger and be able to get more of an individual, uh, individualized risk uh, for passengers, not just the average risk that we're getting from the well-mixed model. So currently we're halfway through this two-year uh, FTA COVID project. And so we want to complete simulations on buses, trolleys, regional rail cars, and subway cars um, uh, that are part of the SEPTA system. We also want to do in-vehicle validation testing of cabin ventilation rates, and then try to integrate those two approaches of determining and predicting risks, that well-mixed model and the CFD simulations. And we're also planning to do some induct experiments to evaluate different airborne disinfect technologies uh, like UV at different wavelengths, as well as bipolar ionization and, and plasmin. And really we wanna ask, are they really needed? Uh, and which technologies, if they're gonna be used, are they effective and safe, safe to use um, for riders as well as kind of operators and people that clean and maintain these vehicles? So beyond that, uh, the research project that we have, we're hoping to take the research information, um, not just put it, put it into academic um, literature, peer-reviewed literature, but actually effectively share that information from those scientific studies with the public uh, to really go after the goal that we uh, had at first, which is to regain the public's trust in using uh, public transit and that it's safe for them to use. Uh, we also want to develop um, and guidelines and standards that are backed up by work that research like, like we're doing, but also informed by industry. So make sure that uh, technologies that may be used, uh, mitigation strategies that might be used, really fit the industry, uh, the type of vehicles they use and, and how they operate them. So for instance, uh, guidelines and standards for ventilation, air filtration, as well as disinfect, disinfect te technology requirements uh, that might be used on transit vehicles. And lastly, we want to implore the government that we cannot wait until the next pandemic. Uh, so we can't go 10, 15 years like we did from SARS to COVID 
uh, to fund research that's, uh, that addresses airborne pathogen transmission on mass transit. So that's my case study that I wanted to share from Philadelphia, uh, and thank you. Thank you very much, Chris, for sharing about your experience collaborating with SEPTA. Uh, friendly reminder to the rest of our speakers, please keep your, your presentations to seven to 10 minutes so everyone has a chance to present their case. Our next case study is titled Preventing Outbreaks on Ground Transportation, and it will be presented by Dr. Yu Guo Li, professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Hong Kong. Yu Guo, please turn on your camera on mute and share your screen. The floor is yours. Thank you. Lucas, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and it's a pleasure to share uh, some of my preliminary uh, thought and work with a case study. So many of us probably uh, have now subscribed to the idea that inhalation transmission predominates the spread of SARS-CoV-2 and transmission by surface touch is most likely insignificant. So very close range uh, inhalation presents the highest transmission risk and in public transport, there are opportunities for close contact at boarding and alighting, and of course, between uh, neighboring seats during travel. Some of us talk about the continuum of short and long range inhalation. A good room dilution reduced short range inhalation beyond 40 centimeters, and by reducing the virus concentration in the entrained air, and, and the entrained air amount at this distance is much greater than the exhaled flow rate. So however, the dilution does not affect a uh, very close range, uh, say within the first 40 centimeter. So wearing, public, wearing mask in public transport can block the direct expired jet of the source patient. However, the expired jet needs to be released from the mask cavity anyhow. So the second, secondary side mask jet, mask jet may affect our neighboring passengers. So ventilation is not alone in dilution, as we talked about, and setting the activation and filtration all can remove infectious particles. They provide effective dilution air, or clean air, or non-infectious air. So is there some combined effects that matters. Um, so what determines minimum effective dilution uh, airflow rates? At low risk, the classical steady wells ready equation can be linearized. Infections is a simple product of quantum release rate, the ratio of inhalation rate to the effective dilution rate and exposure time. So we are interested in what, at what conditions the number of secondary infections is less than one. The greater the quantum generation, the greater the required dilution. Here is perhaps our educated guess. If the typical infectious quantum release rate is 100 quanta per hour for the ancestral uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus, then we would require 10 liter per second per person dilution for passengers at rest. Obviously, if everybody wear uh, a mask at 50% filtration, only 2.5 liter per second per person is needed. So for Omicrons, the transmissivity is much higher, probably say the four times greater, then we require 40 liter per second per person dilution. Obviously, if everyone wear a mask at 50% filtration and uh, for efficiency, then you, you, we need 10 liter per second per person. So if the travel time is less than say one hour, then requirement could be less. Of course, you and I cannot uh, forget about drivers who is there all the time. So most buildings have an effective dilution rate at two to three liter per second per person, I guess, so that mask wearing worked in the first two years, but not for Omicron. Such, such a minimum requirement to me in effective dilution is not a function of settings or room types, apart from the dilution you know, exposure time, but quantum emission rate activity and exposure time. In the two Hunan bus outbreaks we studied earlier, the effective dilution rate 
was estimated to be uh, 2.1 on bus one and 3.7 on bus two. So the outbreak occurred very early in the pandemic. Most passengers did not wear masks, including the, the same index case in two outbreaks. Bus uh, rides were only 30 minutes apart with a higher effective dilution bus two had a lower attack rate. So on buses, as the air volume is small with cloudiness, the clean air, uh, clean air contributed from uh, settling and the de natural deactivation is fairly small. Interestingly, um, studies of in-flight outbreaks may offer some guides to buses, subways, and sub some other ground transportation, although with differences, as we spoke earlier. People probably pay more attention to in-flight uh, uh, outbreaks for various reasons. And of course, the data is useful because the seating is more or less fixed. To me, there is another reason. The cabin environment system maintenance may be more regular and systematic uh, for air transportation than the ground transportation. Amazingly, to me, there have not been many reported in-flight outbreaks during the first one and a half years of pandemic. Every single in-flight outbreaks was reported for a flight duration of one hour or less, at least in the literature. Uh, attack rate in those reported in-flight outbreaks were also much less than other outbreaks. So uh, if you estimate the effective dilution rate, that's about 10 liter per second per person for narrow body cabins and 12 for the wide body cabins. So it's interesting. Um, there have been many monitoring studies of CO2 levels uh, in public transport since 1990s. Uh, many have reported concentration larger than 3,000 ppm at the full occupancy, uh, including the cited here study uh, led by Professor uh, Jack Spankler uh, by, in, at Harvard in 2008. Transport, of course, is a major greenhouse gas emitter, so some, some government only require a very low ventilation rate, about three liters per segment per person, much lower than many other indoor environments such as offices. This appears to be a bit low for infection control. Using um, uh, filtration and GUV uh, may be useful. And for Omicron, the numbers tell us if we have 10 liters per segment per person dilution air, and I've heard earlier 30 air change per hour, and the transmission should be minimum if everyone wear a mask. And this required, uh, required dilution rate uh, also applies to other indoor environment and not just for public transport. Anyway, you have seen my recommended simple measures to in a simple way for long range, should provide about 10 liter per single person dilution, uh, but for Omicron, we need to wear masks. And we can also optimize boarding and lighting dynamics to minimize the close range contacts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hugo, for sharing with us your research on preventing outbreaks on ground transportation. Our next case study is titled New York City Transit Workers and Essential Workforce. And it will be presented by Dr. Robin Gershon, Clinical Professor of Epidemiology at New York University. Robin, please turn on your camera and mute and share your screen. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. I'm just looking for my slides and I think I found them, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, all of you. It's clearly an honor to be in this incredible group. And I must say, being here with you is, it warms my heart because these are things we've been thinking and worrying and uh, just, aggravating ourselves over for at least two and a half years now. And to hear from Scepter, to hear from my other colleagues, it's, it's just fabulous. So thank you so much, all of you. Now, in the very, very brief time that I have, I want to tell you very quickly about some work that we've been doing. And first, just to acknowledge my wonderful colleagues, including our graduate students, and then a little bit about the facts. So some backstory here. Of course, I think you all realize that the MTA is the largest public transportation network, not only in the US, but in all of North America. It's a very large workforce of over 40,000. It has a huge operating budget, close to 19 billion. 
and the ridership pre-pandemic was very high, over uh, nearly 8 million people a day on the transit on the subway and about 2 million on the buses. Now for both buses and subways, we're down to about 60%. The numbers are increasing. Importantly, we have a huge number of vehicles to worry about, 6,000 buses and over 7,000 subway cars. So in the very early part of the pandemic, in the first wave of March 15th to June 30th, and especially during our pause, which was March 22nd to June 13th, when everything, all non-essential workplaces, all non-essential workers, everything was closed, schools, work, everything. The subway, however, and the buses stayed operational. This was a bit of a problem because on March 6th, unfortunately, an MTA, an MTA, as I think you realize, is Metropolitan Transportation Authority. It's a quasi-governmental uh, uh, partnership uh, for the public good that runs the transit system in New York City. The MTA put out this memo saying they were forbidding all their transit workers from wearing face masks, even the ones they can make themselves. Now on March 6th, I can tell you, cause I was here, there was not a mask to be had in all of New York City. Alcohol, wipes, Kleenex, paper towels, Clorox, any kind of disinfection or certainly any kind of mask was absolutely not available. So it was kind of a moot issue to be honest. And of course at that time, even CDC was saying no masks were needed. The WHO was saying no mask. Even Dr. Fauci was saying no mask. Uh, unfortunately, though, this combined with the incredible and rapid spread of COVID in New York City led to a very high rate of infection. It led to home isolation of nearly a quarter of the workforce, either home isolation or home quarantine. Very high rates of hospitalization in this workforce. And unfortunately, a fairly sizable number of fatalities, the exact number of which is not clear, but it's somewhere between, I estimate 75 and 150. We will get to the bottom of the actual number at some point. Now, at the same time all this was happening, the MTA workers were mourning the loss of their families and friends because neighborhoods where they tend to live and the zip codes they tend to live uh, experienced very, very high rates of infection and fatalities. Now, by March 20th, Fortunately, face masks were now allowed. Uh, they did get their hands on some face masks. I'm not exactly sure how. I believe there were some that were cached and they were able to use those. Still, uh, CDC did not recognize aerosol transmission. The masks that were given out were not for the most part N95s. They were simple, just uh, you know, medical masks. CDC did not recognize aerosols till May, as I said, of 2021. WHO not until the end of that year of 2021. Now, some early interventions that the MTA implemented, and to be absolutely fair, this moving target of a rapidly evolving pandemic that was just simply horrific during the early phase. Those of us who lived in the city will never forget the sound of the ambulances because we were losing up to 700 people a day and night and day ambulances were constant, a constant refrain. So it, it was a very difficult and trying time for everyone concerned. But by April 17th, face masks were now required of all the riders and the workers. As soon as that happened, the transit worker harassment, physical and uh, verbal abuse began and assaults, actual assaults, because a lot of riders did not want to wear, wear the mask. Excuse me. Now, at that point in May of 2020, there was nighttime cleaning that began. A lot of our other speakers talked about the cleaning, deep disinfection and cleaning, uh, UVC. Look, um, we looked into this quite a bit. And from our perspective, this provided the illusion of safety, and that's not a small thing. That's an important thing to get ridership to feel confident of coming back. But uh, as we well know now, that absolutely is not necessary. Sterilizing the floors and the subways is not needed. Around that time, because I had wonderful relationships with the TWU Local 100, that's the union for the MTA for the most part, uh, from early annoyed studies and other work I've done on subway, I was able to contact them. We met quickly by Zoom 
and we quickly developed a survey, a pilot study on what is going on with their workers. How are they doing? How are they faring? That survey went out and uh, it was a convenient sample. We had over about 650 responses in just a couple of weeks. It was a web-based survey and the sample looked very much like their workforce as a whole, which is predominantly male, minority, middle-aged, Many of them with chronic diseases, one or more was over almost 40% had one or more cardiac, diabetes, asthma, things of that nature. And when we did our survey at the point of August 2020, a large proportion stated that they had been infected using some uh, very simple metrics. Had you been hospitalized, had a physician told you, and so forth. So it was a very high proportion. Now, the MTA pushed back on that number. They felt their numbers were closer to 15, maybe 17 percent, but our numbers mirror much closer to the Department of Health numbers for other frontline essential workers who kept on showing up through the, the COVID uh, early phases. Uh, at the same time, in August 2020, in our survey, about 90% of the sample said they were afraid of getting infected at work, but a lot of them, and of course, fearful of long-term health impacts, but a lot of them, over 70%, were fearful for their personal safety and security at work. Many of them knew people who had died or had been infected, but still, even then, in August of 2020, this is pre-vaccine, vaccine was still coming, only 30% said they would take the vaccine. Now, at this time in August of 2020, many of them, 80% reported mental health problems. And so uh, their major problem with mental health had to do with fear for their personal safety, physical safety at work. Several workplace interventions were rolled out by the MTA, including on-site vaccine clinics, all kinds of sampling clinics, bonus wages, uh, they were even saying, okay, vaccine will not be mandated because they were afraid of losing too many workers. At this time, also, people who could retire started to retire. These are not jobs that can be just in time training. These are very experienced kinds of uh, transport workers. And so losing these very highly experienced people was problematic to say the least. Um, also, MTA did the plexiglass shields and buses, lots of PPE, lots of safety supplies, disinfection, all sorts of things. Uh, at, so far, it looks like about 77% 70, 70, of MTA workers have now been vaccinated compared to about 90% of all of New York City folks. Also, at the time, another intervention both that they did and the TWU is a focus on the bereavement and the loss to respect it and to acknowledge that loss. So murals were made, things went up at the website, at the headquarters, including maps of all the people, uh, the, the stations where they were, where they lived, and their names and what division they worked in. So I think a lot of attention to that, and that was good. The current challenges right now are rider and worker safety. These are issues top and center for every single person riding now. It's always look behind your back, watch to make sure no one's about to push you onto the track. Some of these horrific incidents of completely random events, just horrible, including, of course, the mass shooting, which uh, did not do much. Nevertheless, even though the perception is that it's terribly dangerous out there, we're approaching pre-pandemic levels, which are much lower than say the 1980s, even the 1990s. So we're, we're actually pretty low. We had about 1400 violent incidents, including some fatalities, of course, since the beginning of 2022, but that's way lower than earlier decades. Now, so based on this pilot data, we applied, uh, similar to my colleague just before me, we applied for funding that came out of NIH. Our study is public health focused. As I told you, we're looking at interventions uh, to assess the health and well being of our workforce. We are focused on the workforce. The ridership is important, but we're focused on the worker. And basically, we are about to roll out a fairly robust uh, study. We've just been funded, it's a five year project. Basically, we're very focused on preparedness for a pandemic. The 2012 uh, H1N1 pandemic plan they had, which is what they had to fall back on, has a lot of gaps in it. And we hope to develop a best practices plan that will be applicable to all transit, as well as other essential work groups that are non-healthcare. We feel there were a lot of things that could have been done that should have been done, but 
look, it was a very fast paced uh, pandemic and they had to do things on the fly. We feel it's essential that we help this non-healthcare essential workforce because otherwise we are creating inequities, exacerbating inequities, occupational health disparities, because even though they had tremendous risk, no doubt, they did not, they were not afforded the same protections, either infection control, either training, supervision, equipment and supplies, or what have you. So that's where we're headed now. And that's as fast as I could go, Lucas. <laughs> Thank you very much, Robin. Um, it, it was great hearing about your experience working with New York City's transit workers. Um, our next case study is titled Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority's Response to COVID-19. And it will be presented by Keith Conway, Manager of Strategy and Policy at the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority. Keith, please, please turn on your camera, unmute and share your screen. The floor is yours. Thanks, Lucas. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, as Lucas said, my name is Kit Conway. I'm a Manager of Strategy and Policy at the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, which is also known as Metro. Uh, we serve riders in Washington, DC, Maryland, and Virginia. Um, before I get started, I just want to make sure I thank the National Academies, uh, everyone who helped organize the event, uh, the other presenters who've already talked about a lot of great stuff, so I'll try to not repeat them too much, um, and all the attendees who came as well for supporting, I, I think, a really interesting and really important discussion. Um, next slide, please. Uh, Metro is one of the busiest transit agencies in the United States, supporting millions of passenger trips each year. And we maintain a vehicle fleet of approximately 1,600 buses, as well as uh, approximately 1,300 rail cars. We have over 11,000 bus stops and nearly 100 rail stations, uh, which help riders throughout the region get where they need to go. All that's to say, Metro is a busy system. And like all of our peers in the transit industry, uh, we really needed to respond quickly and effectively to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which began really in earnest in, in March 2020. Next slide, thanks. Uh, so yeah, so two and a half years ago when the pandemic began, uh, ridership was drastically impacted as the region adapted to evolving health and safety guidelines. Uh, remote work arrangements also shifted the nature of ridership patterns and behavior. Uh, initially in the first few weeks of the pandemic, the general approach to COVID-19 mitigation was surface cleaning. So spraying or wiping down surfaces, frequent hand washing, et cetera. Uh, and and uh, Dr. Gertrand touched on this a little bit, uh, but another another angle I had here was if you recall, uh, the Surgeon General of the United States in March 2020 even tweeted, seriously, people stop buying masks. Uh, obviously, there was an angle there on uh, making sure medical professionals could get them, but I think it just kind of shows how much our understanding has shifted over time. Uh, and as time went on, uh, sorry, still last slide. As time went on and better research became available, it became clear that coronavirus uh, was largely transmitted through the air. And as this information became available, uh, we at Metro worked really quickly to adjust our approach. We handed out millions of masks. We required them uh, on buses and trains and in the stations. Uh, we supported efforts to reduce crowding and we did everything we could to improve air filtration wherever we could. Uh, I also, yeah, I thought it was really notable that the riding public uh, really began to focus on air quality as well uh, and crowding. Um, and so we made sure to communicate details about the air quality in our system. Uh, as you can see in the poster uh, on the left there in the kind of teal, um, that was information we were sharing with our riders, and it, it meant something to them, and, and they found it valuable. Um, it improved our transparency and empowered our riders to make uh, more informed decisions. Uh, next slide, please. And so our focus on air quality uh, really only increased over time as more research became available. Uh, Metro adjusted its approach as a result. Uh, we applied for and received a grant from the Federal Transit Administration. Uh, to study the efficacy of several technologies in improving air quality in rail cars. Um, I'll stop here real quick to just say air changes per hour, uh, which is one of the measures we looked at, uh, is defined as the number of times that the total air volume in a room or space is completely removed and replaced in an hour. Uh, it's one of several key variables driving the overall quality of, of air in a space. Uh, and the general rule of thumb I've heard, uh, people may have heard slightly different things, but uh, in like a classroom environment, you want at least five air changes per hour uh, to help sort of prevent uh, the transmission of COVID-19. Uh, Metro's uh, rail cars before the pandemic were already doing 15 to 20 air changes per hour. Um, so I think that baseline was really important for us to keep in mind. And we made sure to communicate that to our riders uh, who were paying close attention. Uh, and that really helped. Uh, next slide, please. 
So this slide highlights the design of Metro's rail car HVAC systems, and it summarizes the approach we took to our FTA supported research program. Uh, each rail car has two roof mounted HVAC systems, which operate sort of diagonally across the top of the vehicle, as you can see in that second image where that line uh, bisects the car. Early in the pandemic, a lot of transit agencies shared success uh, in installing higher grade air filters or ultraviolet light equipment in their vehicles. Uh, what was unique about our proposal at the time was our plan to evaluate these in uh, alone and in tandem to see where we could gain the most uh, the most improvement. It also represented a promising opportunity to generate additional data and research in a somewhat unique environment, which is a rail car. Um, the use of both of these technologies was really well rooted in existing research findings. And in deciding on this approach, I do want to mention that we we did need to be very intentional about what we said no to. Uh, we received a lot of proposals for technologies that range anywhere from promising but unproven all the way to essentially snake oil. And so we made sure to evaluate proposed technologies really critically. And this was an important factor in our work to keep riders and employees safe. We consulted with guidance from trusted organizations uh, like the American Society of Heating, Refrigerating, and Air Conditioning Engineers, which is also called ASHRAE. I did not know they would be on the call, so I'm glad that that happened, uh, as well as the CDC and the EPA. Uh, and someone from the EPA is also on the call, so I'm, I'm glad she joined as well. Uh, next slide, please. As I mentioned, the research design of our evaluation was to test these uh, technologies in isolation and in tandem. The x-axis here is the number of air changes performed by a system, and the y-axis is the share of uncaptured COVID-19 particles uh, under several conditions. And the goal of this chart is to illustrate the efficacy of our control group which is our existing rail cars with the MERV 9 filter, which is that red line, uh, as well as two of our three experimental groups, which are the green and blue line. Uh, given the similar theoretical efficacy of MERV 13 filters when compared to the theoretical efficacy uh, of ultraviolet C light in capturing or neutralizing a viral particle like COVID-19, uh, if we did include uh, ultraviolet light on its own in this chart, it would be right there under that green line. Um, as you can see, just getting one of these mitigations in place, so going from red to green, uh, is a huge improvement from the baseline. And while these gains, uh, while there are gains to be made from additional improvements, uh, so going from the green line to the blue line, um, they're marginal. Uh, so something like one air change instead of two air changes to get close to nearly full removal. Uh, I want to also note that our research findings have, have generally borne out these theoretical figures, uh, but due to the drafting and publication schedule of our research, uh, with a third party, I'm not yet able to share the exact numbers. I will note that in the field study, we struggled to verify uh, the efficacy of ultraviolet light because uh, by the time particles had gone through uh, the filters that we had in the HVAC system, uh, there was just such a small universe of remaining particles for the ultraviolet light to essentially uh, get a chance to deactivate. And so the, the data there might be a little bit, a little bit fuzzy. Next slide, please. Uh, sometimes a picture really is worth a thousand data points, uh, which this slide really illustrates for me. Uh, we released a set amount of vapor particles in a rail car and recorded how quickly those particles would be removed under different filtering conditions. Uh, so this is just like a visual sense of what we know about these filters already. Um, as you can see, the MERV 9 filter took about nine minutes uh, all the way at the top there to get to the level of vis visibility that the MERV 13 filter accomplished in four. Um, so if you think if you think about that smoke, those smoke particles as COVID-19 particles, uh, and you think about which rail car you'd rather get in, I think you'd rather get in the one with MERV 13. Uh, these are the sorts of improvements that keep our riders and employees safe. And even outside of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have a really strong interest in reducing transmission of illnesses like seasonal cold and flus, uh, and rolling these improvements out fleet wide, which we plan to do, will also put us in a better position for any future pandemic. Next slide, please. Uh, and to summarize our lessons learned here, the three key tactics I would highlight. Uh, first, really focus on proven technology and test efficacy in real world relevant circumstances. Talk to your peers and trusted sources and really be ready to adjust to new information. Second, uh, establish confidence in your baseline circumstances. Uh, this has been touched on a little bit by some other speakers, but for us, it was air changes per hour. Uh, knowing that that was good, it helped us prioritize improvements in the right sequence, um, which made improving filters a higher priority. Third, really trust and empower operations staff. Theoretical concepts are only as valuable as the real life implementation. And if you and your colleagues are not on the same page, uh, then ideas may not even make it to effective implementation. Our ongoing efforts and next steps include finalizing our research report, 
uh, further implementation of the improvements we talked about, uh, finding what's effective and then implementing that fleet wide. And finally, uh, and I'll, I'll share my email in the, in the chat as well, knowledge sharing is really important, both in the transit agency industry and outside of it. Um, so I will put my email in the chat. Uh, it is cconway at womata.com. That's cconway at womata.com. Please email me if you're interested in learning more about our findings once we have them, uh, and if you have any questions. Thank you all and stay safe. Thank you very much, Keith, for providing that big picture of Metro's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Our next and final case study will be about COVID-19 research on London's transport network, and it will be presented by Lena Sirik and Leora Malki Epstein from the University of College London. Lena and Leora, please turn on your cameras, unmute and share your screen. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I am going first and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the context of the project and some of the microbiological surveys that we did, that we did on the London Underground Network. Um, and Leora is going to tell you a little bit more about the predecessor of that work. Um, so I'll start a little bit with the context. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic in London, so this would have been um, March time, um, there was a, a, a significant amount of fear amongst um, the bus driving, the bus drivers in, on the various serv services in London, um, because quite a large number of, of the, or a disproportionate large, disproportionately large number of um, bus drivers uh, lost their lives at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, so this headline here that I'm showing you, coronavirus, five London bus driver, uh, work, bus workers die, union informs, confirms even. Um, this was published on the 4th of April, 2020. At this point, uh, we had approximately, well, about 64 um, per million confirmed cases of COVID-19 and about 13 uh, per million confirmed deaths as a result of COVID-19. And at this point on the 4th of April, um, the national lockdown had been in place for about 10 days. So there was a lot of unrest um, and worry, um, understandably. Um, and TfL approached um, one of our colleagues to, to for, for help on what could be done so that they could protect their drivers better. Um, so Leora is going to tell you about the work that we did there, but before she does that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the um, project that led out of this initial bit of work. Um, so um, while we were working with TF, uh, Transport for London, which is the main um, sort of transport operator and overseer of other transport operators in London, um, we were also interested in the safety of the passengers. So initially we were looking at the drivers, but we were also interested in the passengers. Um, and at this point, UKRI, which I believe is the sort of equivalent of the NSF for you in the US, um, had announced a, a call for COVID-19 studies. Um, and we applied for this and we were successful. So in this case, we wanted to look at uh, the transmission of well, how we could reduce the risk of virus transmission on London's public transport vehicles. Um, and this project had a number of different components to it. Um, it had air quality analysis, which is something that Leora has been working on, a microbiological surveys on the same vehicles as well. Um, it's also included some airflow simulations and then looking at passenger crowding and behavior using CCTV. Um, so I'm going to tell you over the next couple of minutes about the microbiological surveys that we carried out. Um, I wanted to give you just a little bit of background on Transport for London. Um, they are a, a, a large, large operator. They cover London Underground, which is all of the tube network. Um, they also outsource to about 20 different uh, bus operators to cover the bus network. Um, and there's also an overland network and a network of tr uh, trams. So it's a, it's a huge uh, complex organization. Pre-pandemic, they uh, were fulfilling something like 4 million journeys per day on the tube and 6 million journeys on buses. 
um, at the height of that first lockdown, these numbers went down to as low as a few thousand bus journeys and uh, in the low hundreds of uh, thousands for the tube. Now uh, we're back up to about 2.7 million um, tube journeys and about 5.3 million bus journeys. So it's the, the use has not recovered since uh, to, to pre-pandemic numbers at all. Um, so throughout the project, we worked very closely with Transport for London. Um, it was really important that we talk to them about how to sample and where to sample and when to sample. So what we were doing here was taking environmental samples from um, tube carriages or underground uh, train carriages, uh, both from the surfaces and from the air. So with them, we identified how we would do this and where and when. We identified some locations that we would sample and piloted some of our um, methods. And then we collected surface and air samples from eight live uh, train carriages on each of three different lines. So 24 different trains were sampled or train carriages were sampled. Um, we then analyzed these for uh, bacterial colony forming units, which gave us a sort of general um, quantifi quantifiable unit of cleanliness. And we also looked for SARS-CoV-2 RNA copies in each of the samples and we quantified these. We standardized them so that we were either looking at number of copies or colony forming units per 100 centimeters squared for area, for surfaces, or um, number of colony forming units or SARS-CoV-2 RNA copies per meter cubed of air. Um, we then correlated these with observed passenger numbers. So um, I mentioned that the study also involved looking at CCTV footage. So we looked at any correlations with passenger numbers, observed passenger numbers, observed surface touches, um, overall proportion of the London Underground network use, uh, and the numbers of new confirmed COVID-19 cases in London at the time of sampling. Um, so I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about this graph on the left. It's pretty, com well, it is and it isn't complicated. So in red, um, you can see the numbers of new cases of COVID-19 in London confirmed by lateral flow tests and PCR tests. And you can see uh, these sort of dipping, um, then a little bit of a peak here. And then this is as the Omicron variant um, really started to surge towards the end of last year in December 2021. We also have the London Underground Network use in blue. Um, so these are the numbers of journeys people were taking. Um, so the sampling that we carried out uh, happened on the district line, uh, which is one of the three lines that we sampled. This was in May. We then sampled the Jubilee line in November and the Victoria line uh, in December. So the Victoria line was the only one um, where the Omicron variant had started taking off and cases were really surging. Um, so looking at the bacterial contamination, this was pretty consistent across all of our lines. So I think it, uh, it was a, a mixture of environmental microorganisms and uh, anything that had come off humans. Looking at the SARS-CoV-2 RNA uh, copy contamination, um, we found that these were higher when uh, cases in the community were higher, as one might expect. Um, the sort of numbers that we were seeing were up to uh, 10 to the seven copies. So that's in the tens of millions per hundred centimeters squared on surfaces. And we were seeing up to uh, 10 to the five. So in the hundreds of thousands copies per meter cubed of air. Um, and my last slide. Um, so one of the, the main things that we did see was that there was a correlation between SARS-CoV-2 RNA uh, copy surface contamination and the number of observed touches. Um, we also saw that SARS-CoV-2 RNA air contamination correlated with the number of passengers using the London underground network. Um, one interesting thing that we did see was that, um, I'll just show you this graph again. So we carried out a load of sampling here um, at, in November 21, and then again in December 21. The difference between these two 
times of sampling, however, was that there was a no mandate for the wearing of face coverings on the uh, TFL network uh, during this first set of samples, but there was during the second set of samples. Um, and indeed, what we found was that when people were wearing face coverings, although I, I don't have a number for you for you know percentage compliance or anything like that, um, we were we were finding that even though there was a higher rate of cases in the community, um, we were finding much lower numbers of SARS-CoV-2 RNA copies in the air and on surfaces. Whereas when cases were lower, but people weren't wearing masks, the numbers uh, that we were finding were quite a lot higher, sometimes a thousand times higher uh, than when people were wearing masks. So. Um, I think that is all I have to say. Uh, thank you again for inviting us. Sarah. I was so excited at the beginning to start talking that I forgot to say thank you. So it's um, it's really a delight to be here and to hear your stories and compare and contrast uh, how how different and similar things are across the Atlantic. I'll, I will mute myself and I will stop sharing. Over to you, Laura. Thank you, Lena. Um, can you see my screen being shared now? Yes. I'm putting this into slideshow mode. Um, so uh, th thanks, Lena. We we um, she Lena already uh, introduced the challenge that we had. I just wanted to talk a bit more about those very early days, uh, and I really feel for uh, everything that Robin has said because New York City and London are very similar cities and we had exactly the same problems in London, including uh, huge issues with safety of key workers and bus drivers around the network. So when Transport for London contacted us, um, we were observing with alarm the, the huge rate at which the pandemic was actually progressing around the world, uh, comparing it with the earlier pandemic of SARS, which also progressed quite quickly and was recognized as airborne. And we're really influenced by all the advocacy and, and work, um, public work that uh, Lydia Moravska did on uh, making the world recognize that COVID was airborne. Um, I have to admit, we were convinced uh, perhaps before the CDC and the WHO, because of the case of the London bus drivers that we were asked to review, because we could not really find any other mechanism that could explain why their um, deaths were so high compared to the rest of the community. Um, these are the, the news uh, stories you see here are from May. Um, there is a very rapid health review to understand whether their um, death rates were really disproportionately high. Um, that was also done by another team at University College London, and they have found that um, they had a twofold um, uh, excess mortality in that time, and uh, especially between March and May of 2020. And London, I think, entered the lockdown on the 18th of March or on the 20th. So. Uh, so with all of that suspicion, uh, we, we knew that bus drivers needed extra protection because of their um, often belonging to more vulnerable populations. Uh, we knew that buses are absolutely packed in London. So at rush hour, the, a double-decker bus could easily have 90 or 100 passengers on it, uh, which actually means very little ventilation because of simply having less air available. Um, we knew that infection rates in the community were rampant, as, as Lena showed before. Um, and we just, based on the precautionary principle of public health, we said if COVID is airborne, then a hierarchy of interventions are needed. Uh, and we used uh, the, the team members, I have to acknowledge all of them um, on the slide, um, use CFD simulations to start with on a UCL proprietary code, and then supplemented those with experiments on our own double-decker bus later. So uh, we've seen a lot of these uh, CFD studies during the pandemic. Um, I, what I wanted to show you here is that uh, bus drivers in London actually have assault screens. Um, those are there to protect them against physical attacks that are uh, unfortunately necessary. Um, before the pandemic, these were never really considered to uh, needed for um, uh, protection against airborne hazards. Um, and the implications here were that these assault screens needed to be modified. So Transport for London initially were worried about droplets, uh, sprays of droplets by coughing passengers, uh, maybe going through the um, some of the holes around the screen. Uh, we said actually that what was needed was to simulate the exhaled breath, which had unknown quantities of virus in it, um, and, and see how that actually could enter the cabin 
uh, of the driver. So it looks at nine different case studies. Um, and as you know, with the CFD, you, you get concentration maps uh, and you get airflow maps. And these had to be run on the UK Met Office supercomputer, which is the largest in Europe, um, as an urgency me measure. Uh, and of course, th there's a limit to how many of these simulations you can run and what is the actual question that would be helpful to ask. So we started looking at this as an air quality question, uh, trying to find one single parameter that actually made sense and look at what the impact of different operational scenarios meant for that one parameter. So looking at things like, should the passenger board from the middle door of the bus so that they're away from the bus driver? Should they stand at a distance? Um, should it, it, does that make any difference? What about operational scenarios of doors and windows? Um, and what we found is, uh, and also looking at modifications of screen design to, to different degrees of modification, uh, and you can see the table on the left that describes all of this. So from this, we created a very, again, this was a very rapid um, project, created a decision support tool for all the different interventions, which is simply a table of the results of the simulations based on just one single parameter, which is exposure of the bus driver to exhaled breath from the passenger. Um, looking at an exposure per minute, so the fraction of exhaled breath that the driver is exposed to, um, compared to the reference case one, which is before the pandemic uh, and, and before any modifications at all, um, and, and basically try to group those under the, what is the best intervention. So the modification of assault screens by far was the best intervention. It also didn't require any behavioral modifications, and we already knew by then there was opposition to face masks across the board, they weren't available, they weren't recommended by Public Health England for key workers, and the public were not willing to wear them initially. Um, we, we also recommended that bus drivers operate the doors, that both of them are open at every stop, which is every 90 seconds in London, um, that they open their own windows, but there were many concerns about safety in relation to opening windows as well. Um, and therefore modifying the assault screen was by far the most effective intervention. So Transport for London already started implementing these uh, solutions uh, by May 2020. Um, the buses returned to front door boarding. They opened the bus stops at every stop. Um, they started retrofitting all the screens on 9,000 London buses and recommending the opening the windows. And by November 2020, and that's really where we would end uh, this talk, is that um, they fitted all the buses that needed to be fitted with additional separate ventilation systems for the bus driver that avoids recirculation between the passenger cabin and the uh, drivers themselves, um, checked all the ventilation systems, maintained them, and started really intense messaging for all um, stickers on all windows on, on buses uh, to passengers, please open the windows, asking bus drivers to open their own windows, um, and eventually face coverings became mandatory on the entire Transport for London network, uh, which we, we thought was a very welcome um, intervention. Uh, so sorry for all of us uh, overrunning. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, both uh, Lina and Leora, for sharing about your research and its impact in London's public transport network. And thank you to our previous speakers for sharing with us these case studies that serve as examples for concrete implementation in ground public transportation systems. Some key takeaways from these case studies are that first, risk assessment, Computational fluid dynamics modeling and practical microbiology, microbiology techniques are available tools that can help us understand the impact of different interventions in public transportation vehicles. Second, the understanding of aerosol physics is key to develop robust engineering interventions and optimize behavioral dynamics to minimize close range contacts to prevent outbreaks. And third, multi-level interventions focused on proven technologies are necessary to reduce risks and enhance workers' resilience, actively involving them in the decision-making process. In this light, we will continue the workshop with session three, focusing on implementing the lessons learned and identifying gaps in the, at different levels. Dr. Robin Gershon from the NYU School of Public Health, we just heard from, will be moderating session three now. Hello, thank you. Thank you, Lucas. And welcome back. Uh, if you've taken a quick break to have a bite to eat, I hope you had a chance to do that. Uh, welcome to this session three, Implementation, Knowledge and Research to Action. Now we have a great lineup of speakers 
And in the interest of making sure we do not run out of time for them, I'm going to make this intro very, very short. Uh, basically, what we're going to be doing here is taking a look at the barriers to adoption of some of the practices, the best practices for reducing risk. We would like to find out from our wonderful panelists here if they have any practical suggestions or solutions for us to actually implement other than the issue about money. We've heard a lot already about uh, problems with having enough funding to do what we may think is best practices. I'm not sure we're all in consensus on best practices at this point, but why don't we get started right away by letting me introduce Catherine Ratcliffe. She is, if you could please, Catherine, oh, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you for joining us. Uh, Catherine, and by the way, all of the speakers bios and the slides from today, everything is gonna be up on your website. So that'll be uh, very helpful to us. Uh, basically, um, Catherine, if you could start us off by maybe just telling us a little bit about your job at the US EPA and discussing some of your ideas for strategies for implementation. Great. Thanks so much. And thanks for the invitation to be here today. Um, I am a physical scientist within the EPA's Office of Research and Development. I work primarily under the Homeland Security Research Program there. And I first want to start out by mentioning that EPA has played several different roles throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. From um, a regulatory standpoint, EPA is tasked with pesticide registration under the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, or FIFRA, as well as for developing different test methods and um, enforcing pesticide products and devices and get their compliance to FIFRA. Um, from a response standpoint, we've been working um, closely with other agencies and stakeholders to develop different forms of guidance for things like cleaning and disinfection. And where I sit within the Office of Research and Development, we have been instrumental in supporting both the response and regulatory missions of EPA by providing our technical expertise as researchers and then conducting research on a variety of different topics throughout the pandemic. So um, again, throughout the pandemic, we've been working very closely with different partners inside and outside of EPA, including our Office of Pesticide Programs and our Office of Air and Radiation within EPA, as well as CDC and, and NIST and other agencies, um, and our research stakeholders, which have included large transit agencies like WMATA, um, like MTA, like LA Metro, all across the country, to be able to really hone in and prioritize and focus our research on the the things that are most important to these stakeholders and our partners. So specifically my research over the past um, year or so has been focused on evaluating the wide range of different air cleaning technologies, some of which we've mentioned today. And so there's lots of different types of these air cleaning technologies that have been proposed for use in different occupied or enclosed spaces such as transit environments. And they've all been proposed to potentially reduce concentrations of those infectious pathogens in the air like SARS-CoV-2 with the hopes of reducing the risk of disease transmission. So, you know, again, as you've heard, we, we've mentioned today, there's lots of different types of these air cleaning technologies on the market, including different types of filtration, um, different types of ultraviolet radiation, um, bipolar ionization and photocatalytic devices, as well as different portable um, air cleaning devices. And um, no big surprise, I'm sure you all are well aware that these technologies have been increasingly marketed and popular as a result of the pandemic. So early on, you know, we were working again very closely with different stakeholders, including these transit agencies who were coming to us initially with questions based on um, surf reducing the um, loading of different pathogens on, on surfaces like, like COVID-19. Um, but that has shifted, you know, obviously, as, as we talked about today, towards more of the airborne transmission concern. Um, but with different stakeholders coming and asking what sort of technology should they consider using in different environments, you know, as we mentioned Today, there's very um, complex environments um, related to, to the transit industry, subways, trains, buses, et cetera. Um, and so it's really challenging to understand due to the complexity of those environments, um, what sort of technologies would be most appropriate to be um, used in different settings. But the complexity goes beyond there. Um, there's major challenges due to the way that these technologies are currently regulated. So. Many of these technologies are um, considered pesticide devices, which are regulated under FIFRA, um, and that the manufacturers are not allowed to make false or misleading claims about the device performance. But um, under the current framework, EPA doesn't routinely review the safety or efficacy data 
for these pesticide devices in the same way that um, EPA does a more comprehensive pre-market review for actual pesticide products. So there's an EPA number on these devices, but it's a little bit, mis little bit misleading because EPA doesn't actually do that pre-market review of those devices. Um, another complication or challenge is that the um, different technologies are tested in many different ways. Um, they're, the way those ways that they are tested is often not representative of realistic conditions. So for example, you can imagine putting an air cleaner in a really small lab chamber, and then the challenge that then comes with trying to extrapolate those results to something more full scale like a subway car or a different transit vehicle. They're often also tested you know, clearly in very pristine or clean laboratory environments. And we know that transit environments are often not um, clean, perfectly clean and pristine like a um, like a lab setting. So there can be challenges with extrapolating findings from the lab to um, the field settings in that regard as well. Um, so essentially without these standardized ways to test and without knowing how the, the results from the lab test can go um, be translated to the field, it's essentially impossible to understand you know, what a false or misleading claim is under FIFRA. So within the EPA's Office of Research and Development, we've been testing both in room and in duct type of technologies against an airborne vir virus using a systematic approach in a large test chamber with a mock HVAC system to try to provide a more apples to apples comparison of how these different technologies perform against bioaerosols. Um, so this work has been really critical in that it provides insights on how effective these technologies are against airborne um, bioaerosols, airborne virus, and it also is helping to inform the development of standardized test methods. Um, we're also trying to bridge, again, the understanding of how these technologies work in the lab to those real-life settings. So, for example, we've conducted research um, looking at MERV-13 filters that are foreseen or new, as well as MERV-13 filters that have been deployed in transit vehicles in a large um, transit system for varying lengths of time. And we found that you know, even within one week, the performance of these filters degrades um, significantly. So I would say a common theme from the research that we've conducted so far is that there's lots of promising technologies out there, but they're often less effective um, in our lab testing or in the more applied testing than um, they are in the manufacturer commission, commission testing that is done potentially at a smaller scale or more pristine environment. And so I would just um, say that there's a lot of exciting things out there, but we also have a lot of tried and true technologies to lean on and um, just looking forward to, to seeing how these other um, technologies evolve so that we can figure out how to use them most effectively. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. That is so interesting. I hope that you will get a lot of questions. I have a feeling you will. Uh, that That's amazing work. Thank you so much for doing that. Our next speaker is Jennifer DeBurl, and I hope I'm not uh, botching up her name too badly. Thank you, Jennifer. Jennifer, if you could just tell us a little bit about your role as director for Virginia Department of Rail and Public Transportation. Good afternoon. Thank you, Robin, and hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm Jennifer DeBrule. I'm the director of the Virginia Department of Rail and Public Transportation. We are the state transportation agency that supports uh, transit and passenger rail and freight rail around the Commonwealth. Uh, my story today is a little different than what you've heard so far, um, much less on the technical side and much more on the public policy and uh, political side. Um, in 2020, early 2020, before, um, before really we saw the onset of COVID, uh, we had gone through a, a pretty landmark uh, change in our transportation funding package here in Virginia. We had an omnibus transportation bill that passed our legislature, our state legislature in March of 2020 literally days before we all went home um, to, stay, to stay safe from COVID. Um, but that program increased the amount of funding that was available from on the state side for our transit agencies. And it created a new transit ridership incentive program that was intended to, uh, to use some tools to support regional transit routes and to also some support zero fare pilot programs around the Commonwealth uh, as a tool to increase our transit ridership. Uh, we very quickly pivoted um, after it, it became very apparent that we were in a situation that we had not dealt with before, uh, that we were able to push some state funding out very quickly to our transit partners to allow them to make some good decisions to help keep their um, operators safe while we were still transporting um, our you know, essential workers and uh, folks that were transit dependent needed to get where they needed to go uh, during a pandemic. And one of the tools that was very helpful for us is, is 
basically taking that little bit of legislative language that says go try zero fare and rolling that on almost on a statewide basis uh, in, in early 2020 as a way to separate transit riders from the operators and help keep our operators safe. So 25 of our 40 transit systems went zero fare for uh, much of 2020. And as we have uh, hopefully started to put this behind us, we have pivoted back into that transit ridership incentive program, uh, the zero fare component going from being a small portion of that program to being almost the entirety of the program as we continue to pilot zero fare initiatives around the Commonwealth as a way to keep our operators safe, but also to improve the equity and accessibility of our transit systems for Virginia residents and folks that work here. Uh, we also around the same time completed uh, a landmark study of Virginia transit equity and modernization study that's looked at a variety of tools that are available and made recommendations to, to my agency and to the Virginia General Assembly about how we can improve transit accessibility and transit safety for our riders and for our operators. And we're working on the implementation of those tools now, but that includes continuation of zero fare initiatives and the implementation of technology in our systems to help keep our riders and operators safe. So from the public policy perspective, uh, money is always a, a, a topic. We're very blessed here in Virginia that we have a supportive uh, governor and legislature that allows us to, to make good public policy decisions to support our transit agencies and to make sure that we keep that accessibility available uh, to the public, even in trying times like a pandemic. With that, I'll turn it back over to you, Robin, and uh, happy to answer questions later. Thank you so much. So interesting and so much uh, appreciation for the incredible conundrum you had of too much money, too fast. So thank you for that. Our next panelist is Kath Noakes. And Kath, if you could please uh, unmute yourself and tell us a little bit about your role in the environmental engineering for buildings in the School of Civil Engineering in the University of Leeds. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. So um, um, I, I think some of you probably know already, I've had quite a number of roles through the pandemic working around transmission of, of disease. And we've had a number of projects looking at uh, lots of different environments, including um, uh, schools, including uh, workplaces, um, general environments, and including transport. And in session one, uh, uh, Dr. Susan Grant Muller, who, who's part of our team, uh, talked quite significantly about our track project. Um, I also had another role during the pandemic, which was to be involved with uh, the UK government's SAGE committee. So that was um, in terms of how we looked at evidence um, to feed into national decision making. Um, and that was one of the reasons, I guess, I got involved with the track project, which was it came out fairly early on in the pandemic that um, there was a real lack of, of knowledge pre-pandemic, um, but also in the early days of the pandemic about transmission risk on public transport and, and what actually, uh, what those risks were and what the right mitigations were. And I think over the past um, two and a half years or so, we and many others around the world and, and people who've spoken here have identified a huge range of things, but I think there are still a number of questions that we still have in this. Um, I mean, Susan highlighted a number of the, the uh, key findings from our study, so I won't sort of go over that, but I think the key aspects that, that for me to go forward and think about, um, you know, what we can do and how we can mitigate, and particularly thinking around air management, um, I think there is a challenge that public transport is not a uniform thing at all. Um, it is bespoke, um, it, even within the same category of, of transport, you know, buses, there are varying different designs. Um, some will be predominantly mechanically ventilated. Uh, some will have more natural ventilation. There'll be different sizes, different airflow systems, different loading. They will you, be serving different communities. Um, and you know that goes across just about all public transport so any sort of intervention is bespoke and any intervention also has to consider what exists now and what the potential is to do something with it um, and I think we are already also in a position where we we are still 
trying to mitigate COVID, but we also want to be thinking about how we develop public transport to be resilient for future pandemics. Um, and again, as already highlighted, one of the real challenges with public transport is it is an environment where you are in close proximity to other people. And that means that, you know, strategies around ventilation, air cleaning, etc., will have a limited impact on that close proximity transmission. Um, and that might mean that in certain settings, the ventilation perhaps has less of a relative impact than it than in some other environments where people are more distanced. Um, so that's always going to be a, a challenge that is very difficult to mitigate. And you know, masks is, is one mechanism. Um, but obviously we've seen worldwide that there are different um, desires to wear masks among different groups of the population. Um, and that is not, that's probably beyond where we are to, uh, in this seminar today, but it is something that really needs to be thought about and, and going forward and when and where you should put those masks in because they clearly are effective. Um, and of course, other strategies to prevent people or, or limit people who are sick from traveling. And, and, you know, obviously some of that is around uh, policies that are outside of the control of transport operators. It, it becomes into things like workplace sickness um, benefits and things like that. But actually even within, there are things within the control of transport operators, for example, making it easier to um, get a refund on your ticket if you can't travel because you're sick, will certainly find ways of, uh, you know, perhaps, discouraging people who are sick from traveling. Um, so thinking about what we can do in terms of the air, um, short term, I think it's, it is quite a challenge. Um, and thinking about the, you know, this, this winter, what can be done? Um, I think most of it comes around to um, simpler interventions around messaging um, and particularly where if something is, has and a form of natural ventilation to enable doors and windows to be opened, um, particularly windows during, during travel. Um, but obviously messaging needs to focus very carefully on the right message for the right people. Um, it, there's no point messaging if you can't do anything. So you can only message to people where they can make a change. It needs to be really simple, consistent, be really precise about what is required. And I think it needs to be empathetic to the fact that people might um, have barriers to, to following that message, whether that's their, their, their perceptions or whether it's actually some, some barriers they may well have, um, which tie into inequalities that we've, we've talked about already. Um, you know, from a sort of practical engineering perspective, vehicles which are designed to have their windows open can well have their windows open. Uh, and that extends into, we haven't really talked about taxis and minibuses here, but I think that extends here. There's quite a lot of data which shows that CO2 levels in, in vehicle, uh, you know, cars and other passenger vehicles can be really quite high and making sure that, that the uh, ventilation is not set on recirculation and opening windows by a, a small amount on both sides of the vehicle can make a real difference there. Um, and even simple things around making sure those vehicles and their filters are maintained is, is useful. I think where we have um, transport which is predominantly um, mechanically ventilated, there are some bigger challenges um, as to what can be done short term, whether, whether filters can be changed or whether systems struggle with those. And I think this would differ with vehicles and, and trust, um, carriages around the world. Um, but also we found in some of our work that there can be some negative effects. So many of the, the, the vehicles which have a, a, a mechanical ventilation system and sealed windows um, are, are providing a reasonable air change, but it is on a, a, a demand control basis. So it responds often to temperature rather than carbon dioxide in the environment. Um, and actually a mechanism, for example, like leaving the doors open more frequently at a station, which you might think would improve the ventilation because it brings in cold air can actually act to, to make it worse because it will cause the ventilation system to respond to the lower temperature and reduce the amount of ventilation. So we need, it's really important that, you know, this is really bespoke to the particular uh, vehicles, particular carriages. I think longer term, 
there are some real big questions in here. One thing that kind of surprised us as we were going through some of our work and in discussion with operators and uh, the Department of Transport in the UK is um, that there are no standards for the air quality in public transport and particularly in, you know, we were looking at Europe the only standard that actually exists is the health and safety limit for carbon dioxide, which is 5,000 parts per million. That is not an indoor air quality standard. That's a, a, a basic safety limit standard. And if there are no standards that require it, then, you know, essentially all, all the, the transport, you know, all the trains perhaps um, comply with the standard, because if there is no standard, there's nothing to comply with. So, there's a real question about, well, first of all, what, what should that standard be? And should it be a carbon dioxide based standard? Should it be a, a, a ventilation rate standard? If there is a ventilation rate standard, should there also be a filtration standard that goes with it for recirculation? I think it needs to be considered wider than infectious disease. It needs to think about air quality. Um, and particularly if we think again about carbon dioxide, um, there are certain vehicles whereby the, the levels of carbon dioxide don't just depend on the people in there, but they also will entrain exhaust fumes into the vehicle and that can change the carbon dioxide measurements. So we need to think about those as well. Um, and that then plays into trade-offs because of course these um, carriages, vehicles are designed with uh, particular power requirements in mind, particularly energy consumption in mind. Um, there may well be capacity in some, but others are already at capacity, um, you know, the power draw that they take from a, a, an overhead electric line from a train, for example, um, that power is to power the train, it's to power, power the systems, it's even to power your at seat Wi-Fi and um, ability to charge your laptop. And is there any power left to increase the ventilation rate? And that there should be, but it may need to be considered as the expense of, of other things and how those are balanced together. Um, interestingly, some suggestions that electric vehicles might even make this problem worse. So even though they might be better for the outdoor air quality, because the power requirement to run the vehicle is so high, there is less power available to run its environmental systems. And again, that's a question and a challenge. So I think there are some real bigger long-term questions here we need to start on it now because you know vehicles are and carriages are designed and they're going to service and they stay in service for years. We need some right collaboration and we need to feed the research knowledge that we've gained over the past two and a half years um, around COVID and around air quality more generally into being able to have conversations with in standards. And those standards, you know, are it is the manufacturers of the vehicles, not so much the transport operators who determine what happens in those vehicles. But of course, the requirement to, to provide the right environment will be set by governments and regulators um, and potentially some of the transport operators too who specify what those vehicles should deliver. So I think there's a bigger conversation here and that conversation probably needs to happen across um, multiple people in multiple countries. Thank you so much, Kath. And I, I could not agree with you more, it's, it's clear. We need more cross national collaboration, communication, conversations, absolutely. And you, you summed it up so beautifully. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Nathan Edwards. Nathan is the Director of Government Development at US Partnership for Assured Electronics. So welcome, Nathan. Hi, Robin, thank, thank you. So I'm, I'm gonna share just uh, one uh, slide is more of a talking point for um, one of these, uh, some of the considerations of barriers to overcome uh, within you know, our regional transit systems, et cetera. So let me, let me talk through this a little bit. Um, number one, I want to say thank you for, for allowing me to join uh, this last summer. I got the opportunity to host and moderate the uh, 
uh, transit uh, cooperative research program inside event on air quality and transit. I see a number of my colleagues are here at this event today, so this is great. Um, in brief, I'm a scientist and engineer who's worked in the electronics industry for over 15 years with a lot of focus on low power sensors. Um, early in the pandemic, I had um, an opportunity to run a team that conducted over 200 field experiments on aerosol dispersion and control in school buses and transit buses, both of those in motion. So we get we had good physics measurements. Uh, also in office environments um, and, and ways to figure out low cost mitigation techniques that help reduce those indoor uh, aerosol risks um, uh, for COVID. Now, the picture in the upper right is, is a snapshot from that research. It's published and, and you'll, if you search me um, either on LinkedIn or other, you'll see those publications. I have a link in the lower uh, right hand corner as well. Um, and, and the reality is that the broader scientific community, what we've learned and published over the last couple of years is vast. So we have a lot of basis for uh, reducing some of these risks and mitigations. But let me, let me describe one of the barriers and a pathway over that. So in my former career, um, I served in emergency uh, response with regional governments, uh, fire rescue, hazmat, and healthcare. I spent a lot of time in the fire prevention activities. So when asked to share um, a perspective on addressing challenges and gaps and overcoming these barriers towards air quality risks in these uh, public environments and transportation, naturally I drew upon my, my prior experience. So let me start in the upper left corner now. So um, in the middle of last century, the U.S. Forest Service had struggled with natural, unnatural causes of wildfires and, and created these uh, uh, public campaigns using Smokey the Bear and signs like the one you see here about informing the public of fire danger. Um, it, it allows citizens to see what the current conditions might be without getting into the science of humidity um, or heat factors. Um, and it gives them that information to understand should they uh, have an open campfire um, or not. Now, these signs tend to be uh, posted at many of the fire stations across the United States and, and probably uh, globally speaking, there's something similar. Um, likewise, um, in the 1970s, there was a number of deaths caused by structural fires. Um, and the National Fire Protection Agency uh, emerged with a campaign for installing smoke detectors in every sleeping area and uh, residential areas uh, so that it provides um, these occupants situation awareness in the event of fire and give them enough time to escape. And that's kind of the next picture down. Eventually, many states and communities made it law that smoke detectors had to be installed um, in these sleeping areas. Um, and that's been great and it's been a lifesaver. Um, now, in the early 2000s, a similar situation began to occur, and this is in the very bottom of uh, around uh, carbon monoxide. And the reason why this situation emerged is because with energy-friendly buildings, they were tightly sealed. We're talking the five-star ratings, um, but these buildings also had natural gas or propane for heating or cooking. Um, well, due to incomplete uh, combustion, carbon monoxide was a, an outcome of that, and so it became the silent killer. Um, and, and of course, many of you have seen the news with recent tragedy in Mexico with some tourists. Um, out of this uh, situation there in the 2000s, the, the use of carbon monoxide detectors became more prevalent, situation awareness around that, and it also became law in many regions to install these if you have um, uh, a flame source in, in uh, the residential uh, facility. Now, the main point I want to make for the transit industry is that what, what is the analogy that we can use here? And, and the reality is there has been loss of life um, that, that helps raise awareness, but I'd like to take it a step further, and that's um, the hazard of airborne infectious disease and air quality issues. Uh, many people cannot see that. It's very different than, than what Kit Conway presented in the smoke uh, test in, in WMATA and their transit vehicles. Um, again, with the aerosols, infectious disease, we can't see them. Uh, same can go for uh, volatile organic compounds, ammonias, et cetera, all these hazardous um, uh, things in the air. And, and so what I suggest is that we increase situational awareness inside the vehicles and the public buildings through sensors. Now, we have a lot of low-cost commercial off-the-shelf sensors, such as shown here uh, from Temco, and that's just one of many that, that actually monitors all these uh, potential hazards. Uh, but the public tends not to believe what they cannot see. And so sensors provide a way to, to provide that situation awareness. Now, they can also enable um, operators 
safety professionals, engineers of the transit vehicles um, to make good decisions to apply uh, mitigations. And again, we know many of these mitigations and effectiveness with increased uh, filtration, um, uh, fresh air intake and, and ventilation, the wearing of masks, et cetera. There's a lot of things we have, um, tools that we could use. So if this uh, situation awareness information and the data is collected over months and years, it helps inform regional budgets as well. Um, and, and eventually we, we hope to restore public trust in transportation systems, but, but ultimately in the end, improve that air quality scenario. So really to summarize, um, I think we have a long track in front of us to provide situation awareness information so public are aware of, of the scenarios they are in. And hopefully this information will drive change in the environments, much like we've done with the life safety environments with smoke detectors, wildfires, and carbon monoxide and safety. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nathan. And I could not agree with you more. The situation awareness is critical, critical to get people to adopt community-based public health measures. Otherwise, they're not gonna wash their hands, they're not gonna wear gloves, they're not gonna wear masks, they're not gonna stay home if sick. And I I like this strategy. I haven't heard of it before, but I, I can definitely see where you're going with it. It's a great analogy, thank you. Now for our final panelists, thank you so much for being so patient, patient Brian Sherlock, whom I have not met, but I've heard of. It's great to meet you finally. He's a safety specialist at the Amalgamated Transit Union International. So thank you so much, Brian. Please unmute yourself if you're not. Yeah, well, it's not a matter of patience. I tell you, I'm just loving every minute of it. The presentations have been absolutely fabulous. And uh, so I wanted to talk very briefly, I know there isn't much time here, about some practical solutions we can use to keep everyone safer, get riders back into transit, and then just a very brief discussion about why it is that particularly transit in um, uh, the United States has, or North America has been lagging so far between uh, our um, co-presenters from Europe uh, who, uh, have much more modern hardware that's much safer and the public is much better cared for at uh, under half the cost, by the way, um, for a superior vehicle. Now, I'll share my screen really quickly here. Um, and let's see this one. And uh, where is the, pardon my mumbling here as I uh, get this going. So here we go. So uh, a team I pulled together um, ended up uh, getting a grant from the Federal Transit Administration to address a wide range of uh, issues in uh, safety of transit vehicles, service quality, and much of things, number of pedestrians, we run down all of that. And some of these issues about air quality were also able to address. And um, some of the things that have been <clears throat> mentioned uh, I think we have two uh, uh, different groups of uh, big, big uh, concerns. Zoonotic diseases, which you see on the left there on an exponential curve, uh, at least it appears to be that for their rate of increase. Those are five-year buckets on that uh, worrying graph. And then on the right, um, the middle <clears throat> map of the United States is uh, wildfire smoke, days of wildfire smoke, with the dark areas being 70 days a year, a fifth of the entire year with uh, hazardous levels of wildfire smoke. And that was from 2009 to 2013, that's the average. There was a four year gap between these two. And then on the right, you see uh, 2016 to 2020, and look at the alarming increase in wildfire smoke. And, <clears throat> and this is not something that's just the United States or just North America, this is a global issue with uh, Europe um, uh, also facing uh, just a really alarming rates of increase. And uh, something that's been mentioned quite a bit is the uh, level of CO2 inside our vehicles. And uh, this is as, about as good as they get here in the United States. And that was a, um, as far as bus uh, air exchanges. And um, the uh, uh, chart here is uh, with only 25% uh, of a seated load in this large vehicle. And you can see the um, uh, levels are well above where we start having cognitive decline and people 
complaining about being feeling a little sleepy and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, what's interesting here is the uh, bus began with only the guy doing the measuring, measuring and the operator on, bo on board. And then as they picked up people, the levels rise and then it stays kind of flat for a while. They're on the freeway and the traffic is moving. Then the traffic st uh, stops, it's all uh, jammed up and the levels rose and rose. A lot of the ventilation in these vehicles is due to leakage driven by exterior airflows. And um, so we can address a bunch of this stuff. Um, so on the right, you have kind of a, a stylized graphic about how the airflows work in most buses. Uh, again, in Europe, you have some with rounded fronts that uh, uh, don't have this problem. Again, I'm jealous. <laughs> Uh, but what happens in our square brick shaped buses is the airflow comes at the front and then it's forced out to the side and it gets too much momentum to turn the very square corners. Um, and so it shoots out to the side, creating a low pressure zone all the way around just behind the front surface. That, uh, because these things are not well sealed, you'd be just amazed. They're not built like a car, which can be fairly well sealed. Um, the airflow inside goes back to front and exits through leakage paths near the front. So I was particularly interested in the uh, uh, London measurements uh, with the um, or uh, simulations with the driver window open. I think if you measure one, you'll find the air goes out in uh, the vast majority of buses. So that drags uh, pollutants and uh, respiratory hazards and all this uh, past the driver and out. And uh, so what's been done here in the United States and Canada is uh, this image on the left, it's a sneeze guard. Um, unfortunately, the particles don't know they're supposed to stop there and they leak through that open path that's red. We've gotten away from that in this Bus of the Future project. And this is one quick screen grab of it. So it's got um, improvements like no blind spots over 240 degrees, which is just a huge improvement. Uh, other uh, systems, we touched everything in this, uh, but it also has rounded uh, front corners. Uh, if you get to one eighth of the radius or the width of the vehicle as the radius of the corner, you start having the flow stay attached. So you don't have this back to front flow. Then we also designed a barrier system that keeps the driver protected. And um, the idea is to have a separate smaller air conditioning system uh, for the driver's area mounted on the roof and create a very slight positive pressure so that you don't have to have this structure be absolutely hermetically sealed and uh, maintained uh, uh, in a very expensive and troublesome way in order to have the driver not be subject to this leading edge suction effect and diffusion of uh, problematic uh, respiratory hazards. So what you see here is the, uh, if you can see my cursor, this is a barrier door and it can latch either forward here where it's expected to be so the passengers can use the front door or it can latch in this position. Uh, in either case, it's an electromagnetic latch with about 600 pounds of force. Uh, so uh, it's a, a protection against assault, uh, which you heard earlier is uh, going up at an alarming rate. And um, uh, so just uh, uh, here's a view from above. The uh, barrier door is this dashed red line. It can either latch here where there's a secondary panel uh, closing off this area and still providing pretty good sight lines here. The right mirror and all of the windshield can be seen where most of these barriers you're seeing today go up to the toward the windshield and they block views to the right and the right mirror. And people are getting dead because of this. It's a big problem. Uh, and this one, it does have a problem in that reflections off the glazing of the barrier. Uh, if it's very bright up in front here and dark uh, at the front door and behind, uh, then you won't be able to see through this thing. It's a one-way mirror type effect, uh, masking reflection. So the better position is what you see on the right here, where again, there's a secondary panel to create that positive pressure isolation, and there's no um, uh, masking reflections. And um, what we did in this is, uh, again, stole European design credit where it's due and used a three door design in a 40 foot bus, <clears throat> excuse me, in the middle door is about double wide. So there's better uh, ingress and egress for passengers 
uh, even without the use of the front door uh, than there is in a normal, normal 40 foot bus. Uh, and this is what it looks like from the front door with the, on the left, the barrier closed in the expected position right next to the operator. And then uh, on the right, it's uh, uh, closed across the head of the aisle. So the driver gets that improved vision to the right. Um, and then uh, wanted to take care of the passengers as well and um, worked with two different uh, professors of fluid dynamics, one from each coast. Um, and uh, the, this idea of a vertical airflow um, came from Robert Breidenthal. Uh, uh, both these guys are professors of fluid dynamics um, at the University of Washington. And we were working on early day of the pandemic um, quick mitigations that agencies could use. And uh, we're doing that with Virginia Tech. And uh, uh, Professor Breidenthal was informing the process. And um, after we were done with that work, he mused, wouldn't it be great if we could use vertical airflow like in clean rooms? And uh, uh, you heard a thump, that was me falling over. It was such a spectacular idea. And at first I thought, oh, there'd be too many packaging problems and uh, you know this, that, and the other. And the more I thought about it, especially with battery electric buses, where we do have options to uh, run conduits uh, underneath the floor, for example, uh, where batteries uh, could be on the sides, um, the packaging got more and more doable. Um, it's not trivial, but um, I strongly believe it can be done. And um, uh, Professor Breidenthal doesn't do much uh, computer simulation of airflow, so I went to um, a second excellent guy, Vergeis Matai, who has done um, this early stage simulation you see here, which confirmed that the flows could be controlled uh, because there's nothing between your head where you breathe and the ceiling in a municipal transit bus. Now in a plane, there's luggage or uh, various vehicles have uh, obstructions there. Uh, we don't in municipal transit buses, so we can use the whole ceiling as a uh, source uh, for the uh, flows. And uh, that uh, goes a long ways to keeping everybody in their own isolated column of air, as opposed to having somebody in the back seat being able to have the lateral back to front flow uh, infect everybody or a good portion of the folks in a bus, potentially. Uh, so this really uh, mitigates risk. And uh, the union and the Bus of the Future project um, put together some seed funding for a next stage simulation uh, at their super computer, computer uh, center, uh, UMass Amherst. And that confirmed the good behavior of the flows and went into more close examination. So now we're waiting for a build phase of this uh, design uh, and uh, continued exploration of whether we can get this vertical flow to actually work. Um, because And there's a lot of experience with uh, clean rooms working. So it's my hope that um, we can certainly really move the bar here. Oh, the last thing I was going to mention uh, is why is it that Europe has gotten so far ahead of us and we have so many difficulties getting the existing manufacturers in the United States to move forward and do just any kind of design? Um, I'm, I'm working on, on a number of fatal accidents right now that are a result of 20 inch wide obstructions you can reach out and touch in the left front corner. And uh, it's trivial to solve this, they don't do it, they keep paying huge liabilities and uh, they just don't have the engineering to do it. We have a small market for sales every year and uh, they have no incentive because there's a walled garden here. The Buy America standard is uh, something that really makes sense intuitively, but unless you regulate and uh, certify the vehicles and provide funding for research in a very active way, bigger than we do, you don't get change. And the industry has been unable to uh, really respond in ways that keep people as safe as they could be in these vehicles. And so it's my hope that we take the FTA as a model, certify these vehicles, put in more money into research so we can do what so many in this session have suggested, being ready for future hazards. Because as you saw, those hazards are increasing and uh, there are some tough uh, problems ahead. And we have the collective ability to solve this. And we need it for the environment, we need it for our cities to work, 
and we need it to take care of each other. There you go. Thank you, Brian. On that note, thank you so much. I think we are pretty much out of time, out of time for this session, which is supposed to wrap up at 2.50. I'm going to turn over to Lindsay and uh, find out if Lindsay Mara is going to jump in to do the wrap up. Thank you. Thank you to all of our participants for all that wonderful information they shared with us. We covered a lot of ground today about the complex interactions between public transit and the pandemic. I'm going to share my screen again. Um, and it, we'll we'll look again at this this framework that slide that we've seen for every workshop in the series and really how we're trying to take research practice and mechanistic understanding and going from from that to what actually works in practice. And I'll try to summarize what I gleaned from the overview of uh, current knowledge and case studies and the panel discussion that we had today. First, there's tremendous variability when thinking about public transportation. There are different kinds of cabins like cars, buses that are short distance buses, long distance buses and school buses. We have trains that are short distance ones and long distance. These are some of these run underground, others are above ground with different ventilation rates, some as high as 15 to 30 air changes per hour. The numbers of people and their proximity to each other, meaning crowding, and their movement can vary on different types of public transit. Trip length can range from a few minutes to several hours. Risk is strongly affected by infection prevalence in the community. Um, and the infected person's viral load and the resulting emissions. And this variability presents challenges when trying to prescribe mitigation measures. Um, compared to other types of buildings we've talked about in this workshop series, um, public transit is unique. Passenger cabins are not just little buildings. They have operators who are exposed to large numbers of people over long hours and who must be protected. Keeping transit workers safe is critical so they can keep public transit running, which is a vital service that's required for society to function. Contact tracing is very difficult on public transit, so it's hard to identify outbreaks. Thirdly, intervention should aim to reduce the amount of virus in the air and minimize close proximity interactions between people. On public transit in London, less environmental contamination of the virus was found when masks were required, even when COVID-19 prevalence was high. Opening windows is very effective if it's available. Regarding engineering interventions, agencies should focus on proven technologies and test the effectiveness of these in real world situations. Good results in the lab do not necessarily translate to the real world. Upgrading filtration can make a big difference in removal of particles from the air, and agencies need to trust and empower their operations staff to implement these interventions. Public perception is really uh, important. Ridership plummeted at the start of the pandemic and is slowly recovering, currently around 50 to 60% of pre-pandemic levels. Uh, these changes are due to a number of reasons, one of which is the perception of the risk of infection when riding public transit. People feel more safe with widespread masking and cleaning, but enforcement of masking presents a challenge and the effectiveness of surface cleaning and reducing transmission may be limited. Communication, of course, is, is critical. Knowledge sharing among different transit agencies, can they can help each other. Communication with the public about safety measures is key to restore confidence and bring back ridership. Educating the public about actual safety versus perceived safety is important, and providing situational awareness through real-time sensors will help the public to act. Communication must be simple, actionable, and cognizant of individuals' barriers to understanding and adoption. In terms of equity, we should consider the most crowded mode, which is usually buses, and ensure that improvements make it uh, improvements that we are introducing into different modes of public transit make it to all modes, including ADA paratransit. There's large variability in communication with the public across different agencies, and more is better. Finally, there are still many important knowledge gaps. It's hard to detect actual transmission events on public transit. 
we need a better understanding of how the risk on public transit compares to that in other environments. We need to define an acceptable level of air quality. We need standards and to consider how to optimize this with energy consumption and other factors. And finally, I'd like to thank our speakers and panelists for sharing their expertise today. I'd also like to thank the National Academy staff, especially Audrey Thavanen, Courtney Hill, and Crystal Saunders for doing all the heavy lifting to make this happen. Thank you, the audience, for joining us, and we hope that you can take the information from this workshop series and help your community improve its management of indoor air to reduce the transmission of airborne pathogens. Thank you again for your attention.